Number 10, Counter Earth Doom. First up, we see an alternate version of Doom being born, the Counter Earth Doom, created by the High Evolutionary orbiting the sun on the opposite side of our regular Earth. Victor attends school with Reed Richards. The experiment still went south, it still blew up in his face, only he didn't hate Reed after this. He didn't put the blame on him, rather, Reed convinced him to be a good guy and not a villain. Score, what? So in Warlock issue five, Doom successfully stops a bomb during a test and the public loved him. And then in Warlock issue six, Doom partnered up with Adam Warlock himself. What a super duo. And then finally in issue seven, we see this victor meet his demise, taking on the Brazen Brute, who in that reality was actually Reed Richards. Doom ended up using an absorber device to suck up the Brute's energy, causing it to explode. And believe it or not, Doom died a hero in this tale. See, not all alternates in here are bad. Some, dare I say, are Kinda cute, but we'll get to that guy later. But before we get onto those other weird versions of Doctor Doom, if you wanna go ahead and make sure you're subscribed to this channel, or even the like button works too. Both helps us out tremendously, you nerds rock. Now let's get back to this list. Number nine. Zombie Doom. Coming from the Marvel Zombies Army of Darkness universe, we get a version of Victor that starts out, honestly, a pretty decent guy. Again, he originally wanted to keep others safe using his castle as a shelter from the zombie apocalypse. He wants a certain handful of heroes to stay in the castle, so after the zombie plague ends, he can then use them to repopulate the earth. He only let a specific amount of people in, so it was nice, but it's like, mm, could be better. He's a villain, so can't expect much. Now, if there's anything that we know in 2021, it's that no matter where you go, the plague shall follow. The castle had a breach, the virus got in, and Doom got infected. Now, normally this sounds like things are going to get so much worse, but Doom transported the survivors to an alternate universe right before their gross fate. Not all these alternates are bad. I mean, most of them are bad, most of them for sure, but not all of them. Like I said, some are kind of cute. Number eight, Dr. Doom. I wasn't lying when I said cute, here we go. Coming from the Strange Earth 8311, as you probably could have guessed, this world sees our finest superheroes and supervillains as animals. He first showed up in Peter Porker, the Spectacular Spider-Ham storyline back in 1985. The issue starts off with the Avengers saving the day. We meet these weird versions of them page by page, it's super fun, but perhaps the most intriguing change, despite the, you know, animal stuff, is that Doctor Doom is a pop star in this reality, which takes so much skill on top of the whole villain thing. He's a pop star. So many hours of rehearsing. Imagine getting floor seeds to Doctor Doom. What a ride, what a treat. Number seven, Count Otto Von Doom. Taking a step back now to the 1602 storyline, Count Otto Von Doom, a friend of Sir Richard Reed, Sir Richard Reed, there we go, he was still the ruler of Latveria, only his father was involved in studying these shady ways of breeding. So he had these humanoid creatures serve him. Always nice to have a helping hand, I guess, even if it's like that. So when the four from the Fantastic, great alternate name, came along, he of course captured and imprisoned them. So while Reed was in prison, Doom would casually strike up a conversation and try to pick Reed's brain. He was desperate to learn more about explosives, poisons, machines, you name it, anything to gain power. Count Otto was as evil as they get, even back in the day. Now, he sent assassins to England to take out Sir Nicholas Fury, Virginia Dare, and Queen Elizabeth I. The Queen! Doom's men tracked down Natalia Romanova and Doom even paid her off for the Templar's secret treasure, which was a strange golden sphere, like Assassin's Creed style as part of the comic. But when Doom raised the sphere to the sky in true villain form, it was struck by lightning and Doom thought this was how he got his powers. But in this reality, it's just how he got his scars. So when he heard about the four who are frightful, again, an amazing name, finding a lost mystical city, he figured this might be a way to heal the face. So we got a group to lead this journey, even hiring William Shakespeare to document the whole trip, vlog style. What a show off. Number six, Earth X. This storyline, I think humans are well on their way towards. So after the Earth started to experience a food supply shortage, the UN decides, you know what, let's just rummage the sea and get our food from there, whatever, since land has nothing else to offer. Now, Namor wasn't too thrilled about this being an Atlantean and all, so he asked Doom to go to war with the humans, even promising that Doom can straight up rule a planet if they win. Sorry, when they win. Hopeful. 
So Doom's soul ended up in the realm of the dead after that, but that's home for Doom. That's certainly not the end, not by a long shot. Doom then ended up assisting Marvel in a fight against death, resulting in him acting as a defender of paradise. He literally turned into like this angel form. What a look. Number five. Gwenum. Hitting the page for the first time in Spider-Gwen Volume 2, Issue 25, Gwenum, well, you can probably guess. Gwen Stacy turns to the dark side after she sees her father beaten into a coma from Rhino. Thing is, Matt Murdock gave the order. Mm, yikes. She's out for blood, and this symbiote will make it a lot easier to shed it. But not if Frank Castle gets to them first. He actually killed Rhino right as Gwenum was gearing up to do it. Probably for the best that it didn't happen. She's actually out for everybody at this time, because then she breaks into the S.H.I.E.L.D. correctional facility to confront Cindy Moon, and she asks Cindy why she made this mutant spider in the first place. Cindy sees that she's upset, but she doesn't blame the symbiote. She knows that these are Gwen's words and thoughts. The symbiote out is just shouting them. Cindy implores Gwen to let go of her anger towards Matt Murdock, which is easier said than done. Number four, Venom 2099. Kron Stone, the older half-brother of Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099, first entered comics in Punisher 2099. But three years later in Spider-Man 2099 issue 35, he becomes Venom. How did this happen? You're literally in the Spider family. What went wrong? Well, Kron was a bully. He was actually so horrible as a person that Miguel once tried to take him out before all this jazz. So Kron gave the orders to try and have Jake Gallows and his family wiped out, but Gallows found out and beat Kron to the punch. So while he was laying there in a sewer after a knife wound, this black ball of goop suddenly brushed up against him and then engulfed him. The symbiote was different this time around though. See, it had acidic blood and saliva to help get the job done. Kron can also turn his body into a liquid. The guy can literally shapeshift, so of course Venom 2099 is on this list. Number three, May Parker. Venom strikes the Parker family again, this time on Earth 99. May Parker is quite unique when it comes to superpowers. In Jim Kruger's Earth X run from 1999, instead of keeping them a secret, she actually embraced it. I am Iron Man style, which is how I think I would handle powers, but realistically, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. I would retire in five business days, tops. Matt Murdock trained her to use her spider sense like radar, and things were going well, until she became the target of a symbiote, that same symbiote that had been used by her father years before. See, Peter rejected the symbiote at first, so now it was a little upset and it swore revenge on the Parkers, any Parker. Doesn't matter what age, what generation. Venom doesn't take too kindly to rejection, so one day it left an older Eddie Brock and made its way to May. Thing is, when the symbiote did bond to May, her spider sense training came in handy and she was able to subjugate the symbiote and take control. Nice. This is why we all need a crime fighting blind lawyer for guidance. Is it too hard to ask for? Number two, Scorpion Venom. Matt Gargan was a private investigator hired by J. Jonah Jameson to find out just exactly how Peter gets those angles on the webhead. How does he get those TikToks? What is he doing? How does he get those boomerangs? They're always so good. Something's gotta be up. But every time Mac would get close, Peter's spider sense would tip him off and he would easily avoid him. It was kind of comical almost. So step two was let's just pay Mac 10 grand and have him be the subject of an experiment involving animal mutations doctor Harley Sitwell. Then maybe we'll figure out how a wide lens works, perhaps. I don't know, that might be the trick. Obviously things go south, Mac becomes the villain the Scorpion. Later on in comics during Marvel Knights, Scorpion was recruited by Norman Osborn and was sent to kidnap Aunt May, if anything were to happen to Osborn. Hey, if you don't get a text back, go steal that kid's aunt. Awesome, freaks. So whilst on the way to take Aunt May, the recently freed Venom symbiote felt this shared hatred towards Peter Parker and the two bonded, creating Scorpion Venom. Just the absolute worst. You never wanna bump into this guy. And finally, number one, The Punisher. With the Disney What If series launching off this past week, I think it's only fair to include one of my favorite What If scenarios, also the goriest. This one comes from What If series volume two, issue 44. Here we find the Venom symbiote taking over Frank Castle rather than Eddie Brock. Now, I thought the Punisher was frightening before this. Oh boy. This was the most people the Punisher has ever in his life. You've been warned, this is a pretty brutal time. The symbiote can shoot webs, and in Frank Castle fashion, an unlimited amount of bullets also comes in handy. The symbiote tried to take over Frank's body, but Frank vowed to end his own life if that was the case. So the symbiote's like, damn it. All right, fine, fair. Number 10, Paul Sloan. 
Paul Sloan was the third villain to take up the mantle to face. On Earth 2, he took up the mantle after being hired as an actor to play Two Face, aka Harvey Kent slash Dent, in an upcoming film. While on set and shooting the acid disfigurement scene, the prop acid was swapped for real acid. As a result, Paul also became disfigured and turned to a life of crime. It's explained that because Paul was so invested in his role, he got caught up after becoming disfigured and actually believed that he was really the real Two-Face. Batman, however, manages to get him to agree to see a surgeon by swapping out his lucky coin with his own trick coin that always falls on its one edge and can never fall flat. And he did it all apparently while grappling, which is pretty impressive, Batman. I don't know how you grapple with somebody and also switch out a coin, but yeah. Number nine, Arkham. In the Arkham video game series, Two-Face is voiced by the talented Troy Baker, who is known for voicing multiple different characters throughout the series, including many Robins, such as Tim Drake, Dick Grayson, and Jason Todd. In the Arkham series, we get to fight against Two-Face as Batman after he thwarts Catwoman's attempted heist and also decides to kidnap her and put her on trial. After we defeat Two-Face, he is left dangling above a vat of acid. This version of the character was reportedly disfigured by acid thrown by Carmine Falcone instead of Sal Maroni. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you love this list and you want more lists like it, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Charlatan. Charlatan is technically an alternate of an alternate, being that he is the alternate version of Earth 2 Paul Sloan, who's an alternate version of Two-Face. You with me? This is the new Earth version of that character who becomes an alternate version of Two-Face when he is hired by a bunch of other villains to act as Two-Face in one of their schemes. Now the reason they need a Two-Face replacement, well that's because the real Two-Face flipped his coin and based on the result he decided to not participate this time. When Two-Face hears about his new imposter though, who also at one point doesn't even flip his coin before killing a security guard, he is not very impressed. He ends up taking Paul Sloan and dipping him in a vat of acid to permanently disfigure him. After that, Scarecrow utilized Paul as a test subject, experimenting on him until he was 100% fearless. Without any fear. I mean, 100% fearless just sounds like something you wear on a t-shirt, but uh, this is like less fear. 100% free of fear. You know what I mean? Paul then took up the mantle charlatan and became a villain all his own, but admittedly one who started out as an alternate version of Two-Face in the New Earth continuity. So, He's still at his own name, but still kind of two-facey, you know what I mean? Although, he doesn't flip a coin or anything like that, I'm pretty sure, so there's that. Number seven, Telltale Two-Face. In the Telltale games, Two-Face is running to become the new mayor of Gotham and is good friends with Bruce Wayne, relying on his friend's influential support to help him get elected so that Harvey can clean up Gotham. However, in the end, Harvey Dent is turned into a villain after being injected with a substance by the children of Arkham. This causes Harvey to become mentally unwell, developing a secondary persona that eventually takes over, known as Two-Face. I mean, I think we all saw that one coming. He may also become scarred in the game, depending on the player's choices, made as Batman, which of course makes his whole disassociative identity disorder worse and helps it to progress a lot faster. The cool thing about the Telltale games is when it comes to characters like Two-Face, it kind of plays on your knowledge of Batman lore and kind of tries to use it against you in fun ways with unsuspecting twists. So you might be like, well, if he doesn't get scarred, can he become Two-Face? Harvey Dent's always gonna become Two-Face. I think that's just inevitable, sadly. Number six, Wilkins. Wilkins was Harvey Kent's butler, the original Two-Face of Earth 2, and was the second person to take up the mantle of Two-Face. He decided to don makeup and impersonate his employer, committing crimes, but would be apprehended and revealed as an imposter by Batman and Robin. Back in the day, apparently almost everybody wanted to be Two-Face for some reason. There were a lot of imposters. I'm not really sure why. I, I guess there were just a few times when Harvey Kent like wasn't using the persona because he does get better a few times. Also, if you are thinking I should be saying Harvey Dent, if you've been listening to this whole list and you're like, isn't it Harvey Dent? Isn't it Harvey Dent? Harvey Dent is the main continuity version that we have now, and Harvey Kent was also known by that alias. He was known as Harvey Dent too sometimes, but his real name was Harvey Kent, not Dent, initially. Earth 2, Earth 2, friends. Number five, Cancerverse Thanos. 
What a name, Cancerverse, okay? Also known as Earth 10011 is a reality where life overcame death. Which sounds amazing at first, like on a paper, you're like, oh, this sounds beautiful, can I go there? Don't do it, nope. In reality, these horrible elder gods have now taken over. These gods called the many angled ones have now taken out the living and turned them into their personal army of the dead. Nice. When our 616 Inhumans launched the T-bomb, it detonated during a battle with Vulcan and Black Bolt, causing this breach, or a bridge rather, to said Cancerverse. Is that Asgard? No, it's Cancerverse. Let's get out of here, that sucks. So naturally, the corrupted ones on that world wanted to invade our 616 universe, where death is, you know, still a concept. So the Guardians of the Galaxy plus Thanos went into Cancerverse and started fighting back. They allied themselves with the remaining machine resistance led by the Vision. There are only a few good guys left in that universe. Evil Marvel saw that Thanos was now in his reality, and then he joined the Revengers to put a stop to the resistance. After a short battle, Thanos asked, well, rather begged, to die. Marvel goes, okay, let's party. This is perfect. Let's do it. So he performs the ritual to destroy death inside of Thanos, but in doing so, he summoned death into the Cancerverse. That's a no no. You can't cheat death. Thanos is smart, like in a chess way this time around. Okay, it's powerful. The mind's powerful. Good plan. Number four, MCU Thanos. I have to include Josh Brolin's Thanos because it was honestly really intimidating. He looked amazing and he won, first of all. When Infinity War kicks off, Thanos already has the Power Stone in his gauntlet, but he doesn't even need it to punch the Incredible Hulk into retirement. And then after choking the life out of Loki, he added the Space Stone into this gauntlet. This guy had two Infinity Stones before the title card even popped up. After seeing the trailer, I thought for sure it would have taken him both movies to collect the stones. Consider me fooled. You got me. After obtaining five of the Infinity Stones, he literally walked through the Avengers, pulled the Mind Stone out of Vision's head like a hangnail, and completed the mission. And then he snapped half the universe away. So, he won. We have to include him. Number three, the Champion of Titan. In Thanos issue 10, we see a pretty exciting but concerning storyline. When the Abomination is crushing the Avengers in a fight, Sam Wilson, Captain America, is being choked out, it's intense, it doesn't look good, and then Spider-Man rolls up with Vision, Daredevil, Ironheart, Miss Marvel, and Champion Thanos. Avengers assemble. What? Thanos lands and starts to call the shots. He's telling people just to get out of the way while he rolls his wrists out. He's ready to lay people out. Now you'd think Captain America would be jealous here or concerned, but he's glad to see him. Even Abomination is excited about what's about to happen. He was wondering when the Champion of Titan was going to show up. Thanos refers to the Avengers as his friends, how lovely is that, beats the life out of Abomination, also lovely, and then he leaves a message that the world is under his protection and the crowd goes nuts. We love this, apparently, it's, I don't know. Then the next page, it cuts to the garden and Thanos is just hallucinating. He's tripping out, all this didn't happen. He had us in the first half as well. Damn, got us again. Number two, 20XX Thanos. Residing on Earth 15061, this version of Thanos is pretty badass. This version appeared in US Avengers 1 and 2, but he wasn't around too long, but he definitely made a mark. He's pretty similar to our main 616 Thanos, only he has two gauntlets this time around. Two. Instead of finding the Cosmic Cube when he arrived to Earth, he used Project Pegasus tech to make Cosmic Cube ISO gauntlets, so he got a bit more than he bargained for. And similarly to Infinity War, he killed half the population on Earth. And of course, included in that list is many of Earth's mightiest, but like I said, he was only around for those two issues. So what happened? He had the Cosmic Bling, I don't understand. Black Widow ended up calling the remaining Avengers and they bumped heads and figured out a way to take him down. Good ending, good ending, we love those. And finally, number one, King Thanos. Perhaps one of the coolest versions of Thanos and one of the mightiest is of course where he wins. Thanos Volume 2, Issue 13. The cover alone is haunting. All of our heroes have fallen and Thanos stands above all of their gear. In this storyline, the Avengers have now gotten old and Thanos has only gotten stronger. And like always, he was out to impress death, so he had fun taking out pretty much every living thing in the galaxy, becoming the king of everything. Well, rather at this point, the king of nothing. At this point, he platinumed the game. The universe was wiped, he was done, he was packed out, he himself was ready to join death. So he gave a piece of the time stone to his servant, the rider, and asked him to go back in time, boop, 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 and get younger Thanos, 
bring him to the future, and then get him to kill older Thanos. The time traveled Thanos came, a fight obviously ensued, but in a Batman vs Superman like fashion, King Thanos reminded young Thanos the name his mother was going to give him before going mad, Dion. The younger Thanos realized his whole reason of being there was to kill himself and he was like, no man, I'm actually not on board with that, thanks so much for asking. He then took that time stone piece and returned back to his timeline with a new goal, to avoid all of what just happened, he's like, nope, don't want that future. So Elder Thanos began to vanish while this happened, along with the entire timeline. He beat the entire universe though at one point, so you gotta admit, He's definitely number one. Number 10, Sea Lord. I mostly like this version of Namor just because I like his medieval and kind of Greco Roman, really, garb here. Sea Lord is the medieval version of Namor who was created when Morgan Le Fay warped reality, putting all heroes in a medieval like setting and imprisoning Scarlet Witch, who was one of the few who remained conscious that this reality was not actually the true reality. Eventually, Wanda, utilizing Wonder Man, would free everyone from Morgan Le Fay's altered reality and also defeat the evil sorceress. But until that happened, Sea Lord aka Namor, like the other heroes, would believe that he was a member of the Queen's Vengeance. Everyone who had been fighting previous to the reality warp against Morgan Le Fay, now stylized as the Queen in this reality, sought to protect her as part of her elite guard, the Queen's Vengeance. Namor included. Ultimate Namor. This version of Namor is not actually the ruler of Atlantis, but is considered a false king. In the Ultimate Universe of 1610, Namor is an ancient Atlantean criminal who was imprisoned and kept asleep for 9,000 years. Kind of like a mummy, but without all the being dead and looking gross parts that come with that monster type. Namor initially proved to be too powerful for the Fantastic Four to handle, and at one point threatened Manhattan with a giant tidal wave unless Sue gave him a kiss, which she did, and keeping his promise, he ceased his attack and returned to the ocean. I like that he was just like, I just want a kiss and then I'm out, so it's cool. It's cool, I'm easy to appease even though I could just literally wipe the floor with all of you. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you love Namor as much as I love Namor, please be sure to show your love by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Conqueror Namor. This Namor doesn't really have any fancy names, so I kinda just decided to give him one. So just so you know, this isn't like an official term or an editorial term, this is an Amanda term. He shows up in Volume 1 of Exiles, Issue 15, and hails from the the alternate Earth of 1016. He ends up being defeated and likely killed by the Mimic of Earth 12, who is a member of the Exiles team. Namor here is obsessed with conquering and appears to have become King of Latveria as well as Atlantis. His goal is to win all wars against any who oppose him, continuing years and years of war. But why? Well, because he knows that in fighting against the Latverians or any who still oppose him, it will only bring Atlantis more glory. Mimic attempts to talk sense into to Namor as he has found a friend in the version of Namor from Earth 12, his own reality. Unfortunately, Conqueror Namor only cares about just that, conquering and greater and greater wars and victories for Atlantis, and he will hear none of it. And so Mimic is forced to destroy him, although the Namor of Earth 1016 does put up a really good fight at least. Number 7, Hippie Namor. This version of Namor hails from Earth 71853 and made his first appearance in 2018's Exiles in Issue 3. When the Exiles arrived in Hippie Namor's home reality, he sensed that they really needed to chill. He offered them whatever their heart desired to help them calm down as they seemed to be wound up a little too tight. However, the reason for their mood was soon revealed after the Time Eater arrived and devoured Hippie Namor and his reality, destroying it temporarily. I say temporarily because once the exiles were able to defeat the Time Eater, the reality of 71853 and its version of Namor were restored. Yay! Hippie Namor lives. Number 6, Emperor Numenor. Emperor Numenor hails from the reality of Earth 311, that of the 1602 universe. Here, Namor is not a ruler of Atlantis, but a ruler of what is referred to as Ben Asylum, the city of the gods. It's basically just Atlantis as it's still, you know, deep below the ocean in a trench, but it just sounds cooler in the 1602 universe. A city of the gods, you know what I mean? Here, Namor ruled Ben Asylum with his cousin Rita, who he hoped would marry someone soon. He himself became enamored with Susan Storm of the four from the Fantastic. Unfortunately, he would be unsuccessful in winning her as his bride as Count Otto Von Doom betrayed him in their scheme, double-crossing and killing Namor. 
Number 5. New Earth Catwoman Obviously one of the most powerful versions of the now more often hero would be her previous main continuity counterpart, the Catwoman of New Earth. While this version was part of a main continuity, used to be the main continuity, it should be noted that New Earth could be considered an alternate reality now in regards to the fact that we have Prime Earth now, which is considered the current main reality, leaving New Earth as an alternate or a previous main continuity if you will. Catwoman in this reality was wasn't known for having powers, but she still had an impressive set of skills comparable to our Earth main continuity Catwoman. New Earth Catwoman is a master of thievery, disguise, and stealth. She also seemed to have a somewhat superhuman connection to cats who were often drawn to her and would even sometimes fight to protect her, or could be convinced by Selena to do her bidding. Selena was also a very skilled fighter and known for her combination of flexibility and strength. It's a powerful combo. Because if you're strong and you're not flexible, woo, you're going to be in pain later. Number 4. Earth 1. Silver Age. This is me being brackets. Earth 1 Catwoman is our Catwoman of the Silver Age, who first appeared before it technically started, appearing in 1954 in issue 203 of Detective Comics. And I think the Silver Age is supposed to have started in like 1956. So. Kind of a little early, but she was there for the rest of that. This is the Catwoman who also had some flying skills and even at one point had her own cat plane. She also was able to train feline animals, including more wild and dangerous ones like ocelots. She was also a skilled combatant and often fought with a whip or whips, also coming equipped at times with her own version of the Batarang. The Catarang. I love it. Oh, Earth One Catwoman. But not to be confused with Jeff Johns' and Gary Frank's Batman Earth One, who we already discussed earlier. The DC continuities and multiverse are an experience to keep straight in one's mind. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing all the math every time I'm talking about different Earths in DC, because there's some that have the same numbers, and it's how you write it. Some of them are like the number one, other ones are like you write the one. <sighs> it's confusing. John's and Frank's actually I think is you write the number one, but then in the comic that it's from, it's actually spelt out O-N-E, so that's, what is that about? That's a contradiction. Anyways, I'll leave the DC multiverse alone for a bit. Number 3. Future State In Future State, Selena appeared to have more connections and also came with more high advanced tech. Due to Gotham City existing in a cyberpunk-esque, sometimes almost totalitarian future, we see some of her tech during her train heist, which she is able to execute thanks in part to her magnetic suit. Catwoman also teams up with the Gotham City Sirens in Future State, so she also at times has her allies, Poison Ivy and the new android AI and gal pal Dee Dee to back her up. And if you're wondering where Harley was, Harley was off doing other stuff in Future State. She has her own series. Number 2. Earth Whatever <laughs> Earth whatever. During the events of Salvation Run, there was a time where it appeared as though Catwoman herself was super powered, but in reality she was just in stasis, and all the events that we believed were happening on an alternate Earth were really happening in her mind. Catwoman definitely believed she was on an alternate Earth, but nah. Still, in her mind, Catwoman was impressively powerful, even though it wasn't real. Catwoman at first just thought she was on an alternate Earth, one where for some reason she had powers. She dubbed this Earth, Earth whatever. I think dream realities could also be considered alternate realities, so even though this wasn't real technically, we're gonna count it. I mean, what is reality anyways, right? I could write a whole video about that and we could dive into the philosophy of like, how do we even know what reality is? Catwoman here appeared to be invulnerable, had some level of super strength, and could possibly even fly. She also seemed to have a level of super speed and, as always, was a master thief with major sleight of hand skills. In issue 77 of Catwoman Volume 3, we see her use her abilities and fake powers fake powers, to take out some of the strongest players of that universe in her mind, including Batman, Superman, Green Lantern, and The Flash. Wow. Number 1. Batman Beyond In the Batman Beyond universe, Catwoman is the daughter of the villain Multiplex, aka Danton Black. As his daughter, she also possesses the ability to create duplicates of herself and can make up to 9 dupes at once. This version of Catwoman is also a thief who possesses an advanced exosuit that also makes her stronger, faster, and more durable, similar to Terry McGinnis's suit. Not only does this version of Catwoman have superpowers, and advanced tech, but she also has a skill set similar to Selena's. She's a highly experienced and gifted acrobat and gymnast. Kicking off the list at number 10, 
Thinos. Uh-oh, this is why you never skip leg day, ever. Kicking this part two off on a weird but fun note, Thinos was a minor character in the 1991 What The series. A minor character with a major change. This comic run showed us some insane alternate realities, like the same issue Thinos comes in, there's also the mean cuisine. And his body is a watermelon. Just wacky comic book fun. 11 pages later, we meet the Mad Titan who could easily squish mean cuisine between his legs. The evil star-spanning destroyer of the world's Thinos not to be confused with the postal worker who must also have some pretty incredibly thick thighs, I guess. Even in this universe, Thanos was still trying to win over death at the New Year's Eve party. Just do squats in the garage, that'll probably work. You'll get some people's attention. Number nine, animated series Thanos. The first version of the Mad Titan outside of the comics wasn't around for too long, sadly. See, the Silver Surfer animated series came out in February 1998, the same animation style as X-Men, but after just one season, it was scrapped. The season did end, of course, on a cliffhanger involving Thanos. Thanos' brother in this storyline was Mentor, and they were sons of the scientist supreme of the Titan system. Each were genetically engineered for different reasons. See, Mentor was meant to study and learn. As his name would probably hint, he hit the books, while Thanos was made to punish and avenge. Thanos wasn't fitting in, so the philosophers of Wynn are like, hey, why don't we just send Thanos to planet Zen La? Maybe he'll learn a little something there. And he did. He learned to become a disciple of Lady Chaos, and he would have these loving conversations with her, her being a statue, of course. More like a podcast, one-sided conversation. He was just letting things out, I guess. He was getting nothing back, nothing but red receipts from a stone, so he thought, okay, I'll get her attention by wreaking havoc across the universe. That ought to work. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be awesome. We're talking about Thanos, some dark futures. It's a part two. Add some light into it. Hit that thumbs up, then we can all smile and move on together. Back to the list. Number eight, Thanos Doppelganger. When the dark side of Adam Warlock, Magus was out trying to conquer the cosmos, he first thought it would be beneficial to create doppelgangers of all of our heroes and villains. The doppelgangers are usually obvious, you know, they're evil clones of whatever character they're supposed to be. But when he created a Thanos clone, he looked identical to the real one. He didn't have like arms hanging out of his head or anything, he was just another Thanos. So now Magus has Thanos as a sidekick, which sounds like a duo I try and avoid. But like the real Thanos, this Shade version too wanted to conquer. In Infinity War issue 5, both Titans come face to face and decide to team up and take down the Magus. But in usual comic book fashion, in order to penetrate the door into the Magus throne room, one of them, just one of them, had to perish. So they both fought, they monologued, and finally doppelganger Thanos goes astral and then becomes a butterfly. Lovely, how lovely is that? This sounds great, and it is for a moment. That is until real Thanos eats the butterfly in order to regain lost portions of his personality. You're not you when you're hungry. Number seven, what if? These are always so fun to do, and with what if premiering this week on Disney Plus, we have to include this bizarre version of the Mad Titan. And what if volume two, issue 34, Thanos defeats Galactic this or rather, he's able to change him back into a human being. Thanos conquers the cosmos and Galactus was reborn as a king. The king of rock and roll, that is. You gotta love what ifs. Galactus, of course, had his memory wiped after this rebirth, so when he's born again in Kansas, he just begins a rock and roll career. I mean, what else is there to do in Kansas besides that, I guess? When Adam Warlock stopped Thanos, Galactus had the choice. He had the choice to continue rocking out or get back to his planet eating days. Even the Watcher at this point takes a break observing, and then he listens to his favorite hits. Number six, Thermos. Another gem, this time coming from the 1988 What The series. Here, he's the master of space, time, and barbecue sauce. Okay, the three most important things in the universe right there, I guess. In issue 24, right on the cover, we meet Thermos. It's a fun roast of the Infinity Gauntlet storyline, while well, this time it's the Infinity Mitten. You can't really snap in it, you'd be like, and it starts off with Thermos and Mephisto planning a double date with Death and her sister, Taxes. The weirdest part would be that, I mean, sure, this comic is a fun parody, it's all fun and games, but he's still evil. He plans on using the Infinity Mitt so he can barbecue Earth's mightiest. Puns aside, that's pretty horrible. With barbecue sauce too? Like, are you gonna like lather them up? This guy's twisted. Number five. 
Ultimate Doctor Doom. Earth 1610, home of the Ultimates, we find Victor Van Dame make his first appearance at Ultimate Fantastic Four, issue two. Later on, he worked alongside Reed Richards to develop a teleporter to the end zone. But without anybody else knowing, Victor changed the coordinates, and that's what resulted in the creation of the Fantastic Four's powers. Thing was, Van Dame was also caught up in this accident turning his skin into this metallic flesh. He had these clawed hands and his legs resembled that of a demonic goat with hooved legs. It was, it was a thing. He ended up becoming the leader of the Keep, which was a small nation, but he made every citizen get a snake tattoo so he could then use that to control their minds. Not bad, 10 points to Slytherin. Number four, Lord Doom. This sounds great already. Coming from the Old Man Logan storyline, issue 71, volume three of Wolverine, we get to meet one of my favorite versions of Doom. Lord Doom has a pretty large chunk of land, bigger than we knew before. It was appropriately named Doom's Lair. I mean, it's a bit bigger, it's a bit of an upgrade. Doom teamed up with the other supervillains in the storyline and they all won. Most of our heroes were dead in this timeline. I don't know what it is, I love seeing villains win. The end of Infinity War, I was like, yes, do it. No one comes back, that's it. We don't see much of him, but knowing that he's part of the evil that's not only survived, but still rules, it's quite intimidating. Number three, All Father Doom. After waking up in the future in 2099, Doom traveled to Latveria only to find a new ruler who took his spot, the cyborg Tiger Wild. During all that time, somebody had to step up, but Doom wasn't having it. Being the fierce leader he is, he demanded that Wilde steps down from the throne, even though Wilde saved Latveria from its own demise. A fight naturally broke out, but Tiger Wilde's advanced tech allowed him to remain on top. To add to Doom's horrible day, Tiger took off Doom's mask and noticed that there weren't any scars, despite of what history has taught him. So he took it upon himself to scar Victor by burning him himself. Terrible. So afterwards, Tiger ordered Fortune to kick him out. Only Fortune, she saw Doom as her only chance to overthrow Wild. So she took him back to her Romani clan, Zephyro, and they found a doctor in the Pixel Corporation on the Isle of Lobos de Oferia. The doctor Celia Quinones enhanced Doom with nanotechnology. That plus stolen Pixel tech allowed for Doom to be a little more mighty on his next trip to Liberia to retake his throne. Number two. Dictator Doom. In the House of M storyline, placed in the alternate reality of Earth 58163, beginning in 2005, in this story, we see Doom take on a new approach with Magneto. See, during the mutant human war, Doom stood next to him and he fought beside him. At this point, Doom knew that mutants were going to come out on top, so if you can't beat them, join them. They are super villains, so it's not like they got along or anything. They still didn't trust one another, but they respected each other's powers and goals. So after the mutants did win, Doom took over a new Latveria, marrying his love, Valeria. So Doom studied the bodies of Reed Richards, John Jameson, Ben Grimm, and Susan Storm. He studied their cosmic rays and then soon figured out how to advance himself and others. So Valeria, his love, became the new Invincible Woman, and their adopted son Kristoff became the Inhuman Torch. With the addition of a monstrous Ben Grimm to serve, they became the Fearsome Four. And finally, number one, God Emperor Doom. Even that name alone, this version for sure takes the cake. After being empowered by the Beyonders, Doom became the ruler of Battle Worlds, and for years and years he toyed with the minds of our remaining heroes until they honestly didn't remember what life before them was even like. It was all a blur at that point. He ruled next to his sheriff, Doctor Strange, and married that world's Susan Storm, now becoming the father of Franklin and Valeria. Johnny Storm was cast out, literally becoming the sun, while the thing became the wall surrounding Battleworld's edges. Crazy. Doom's science division was the future foundation, and his backup was none other than the Thor Corps, a police force made up entirely of Thors from across the multiverse. And yes, that probably includes Throg. When it comes to power, the Secret Wars version of Doom isn't a joke. He took down a Phoenix-powered Cyclops with ease, and he stopped Black Panther, who at the time was wielding the Infinity Gauntlet. After Molecule Man took the godly powers from Doom, the multiverse was restored, but the fear still lives in our head rent-free. Now with the MCU bringing Marvel's first family to the big screen right after the multiverse run of movies, I feel like we could possibly see the Secret Wars version of Doom sooner than we think. I think the next big movie is going to be Secret Wars. I'm calling it. After Young Avengers, then Secret Wars. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Lee Price. 
Making his comic book debut as Venom in Volume 3, Lee Price had a pretty rough life, before the symbiote stuff even. He was bullied, his father was horrible to him and his mother, so he burned the place down to the ground. Which is not a great way of handling the situation, but comic books, you know, what are you gonna do? He blamed the fire on a mutant boy with pyrokinesis, and when he grew up, he suppressed all of it. He actually believed down the road that his father had abandoned him, and that the fire was actually caused by the mutant. He was in protective services after that point, and as an adult, he would join the army rangers, until he was injured in a mine explosion, which in turn left him without a few squad members and a few fingers. Discharged and left without any benefits, Lee had no choice but to accept a job from Mac Gargan to be a tough guy while the deal goes down between Black Cat's gang and Tombstone's gang. That's when he found the symbiote, or rather, the symbiote found him. Number 9. Ultimate Venom Venom of Earth 1610, aka the Ultimate Universe, made his first appearance at Ultimate Spider-Man 33. Now the Ultimates are great, for the most part. We see these major changes to the heroes we thought we knew, like Thor, for example, isn't a god this time around. Gwen becomes Carnage, and Wanda and her bro... They're close, they're closer than the other version, that's for sure. In this tale, Richard Parker and Eddie Brock Sr. were working together to develop a way to heal humanity. The symbiotic biosuit named Project Venom was underway. <clears throat> the project was adding up to be more than a two-man job, so they partnered up with Trask Industries for some help. The company eventually realized the potential of the symbiote and figured, eh, let's just use it as a bioweapon and create super soldiers. Sounds good, let's do it. That ought to do something, right? Well, it did do something. When Richard and Eddie were on a plane to fight Trask in court, see, they had secretly created their own version and wanted to pull it out to prove ownership. But Eddie pulled the suit out a little bit too early while they were still flying, and that's how they all perished in the Ultimate Universe. As a student, Eddie Jr. began studying a sample of that same Venom project with Dr. Kurt Connors, and Peter took a piece to study himself. After Peter spilled a drop on his hand, he got the black suit makeover, cranking his powers up to 10. He was now untouched but when a robber shot another man, this triggered Peter. It reminded him of his Uncle Ben and what happened, so he went full Venom. He made an absolute mess. He lost his symbiote after getting entangled in electric cables on purpose. He wanted this thing to go. The only parts left were in his bloodstream, and also that other sample left at the lab, which yes, Eddie Jr. ended up finding. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it. If not, still give it a thumbs up and still give us more chances. I don't know, back to the list. Number eight, Demon. Coming in hot from Earth 5101, Pavatar Prabhakar made his first appearance in Spider-Man India, issue one. Pavatar moved to Mumbai with his Aunt Maya and Uncle Bim to continue studying. He got half a scholarship and was determined to keep the success train going. His best and only friend, MJ, Mira Jane, stood by his side all the while. He got his powers through an ancient ritual, which in my opinion is way cooler than a spider biting your hand mid-photo, you know? Nalan Oberoi, a crime lord of this alternate reality, used an amulet to get himself possessed by a demon. That demon was determined to hold the door open for other demonic forces. Pavatar, while being chased by bullies, ran into an ancient yogi who then gave him the powers of a spider. Which sounds great, but when you find out that this reality's venom is a century-old demon stuck in an amulet, you get a little bit nervous for him. Demon Venom was freed by a cult called the Neo Alvers, and once he was free, nearby towns were just obliterated. You know the rest. He had us in the name Demon, let's be honest here. Number seven, She Venom. Anne Wang, aka She Venom, will be returning in Venom Let There Be Carnage. Michelle Williams is set to return, of course, and she's been around in comics for a while. She first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man issue 375 back in 1993. She first met Eddie while at Empire State University and she actually fell in love with him quite fast because, you know, he saved her life from a group of thugs. That ought to do it. So they get married, Eddie starts working for the Daily Globe, she was a lawyer, and everything sounds like a pretty fantastic household if you ask me. You know, until Venom Dark Origin issue 2, when she divorced Eddie after getting sick of his spidey hatred. Once Eddie got the symbiote, Spider-Man asked for Anne's help. Any hot tips, favorite driving ranges, come on, help a brother out here. So she explained some of his history and it did help, Spider-Man was able to meet up with him in issue 375 of The Amazing Spider-Man. But Anne followed in the background as well, she wanted to talk to Eddie and talk him down from this vendetta. Things were actually starting to cool off for a bit, and then these idiots show up to take everybody in. That doesn't happen, obviously. Instead, Anne is put in danger, and Spider-Man helps Eddie save her. And then the two webheads make a deal. Later on in Venom, Sinner takes all issue two, Anne was shot by the third Sin Eater, and was bleeding internally. It wasn't looking good. 
Venom carried her away to a secret hideout, and the only way she could survive was if the symbiote attached itself and healed her, thus creating She Venom. Number six. Anti Venom. When Eddie Brock and the symbiote did separate, you would think that would be the end of it, or something good at least. Well, in fact, without the symbiote, Eddie has to now live with cancer, which sucks. But he spent his days volunteering at the Feast Center, so he's trying. Something's happening, he's trying to make good. Martin Lee, aka Mr. Negative, used his powers to cure Eddie's cancer. Just Eddie? Like, I feel like there's a lot of other people we could help out, but okay. But in doing so, Lee accidentally infused the symbiote into Eddie's bloodstream, so the symbiote was fused into his white blood cells. In The Amazing Spider-Man issue 569, Anti-Venom is now born. It's just Venom with the opposite colors, essentially with the white blood cells added in there. This version of the symbiote has phenomenal healing powers, as you would guess. It can create antibodies that cures any known disease or any impurities with your body. Now, the main difference between Venom and Anti-Venom is that Eddie Brock is now in full control. He's got two hands in the wheel this time around, and the symbiote lasted a few years in the comics, and in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 671, it was destroyed when it was used to cure the spider virus. Number 5, King Namor. King Namor hails from the reality of Earth 6706, and here is married to Susan Storm, and together they have a son named Gambit, another son named Johnny, and two daughters, Aaron and Ari. Gambit is like kind of a blonde Namor in terms of his armor and his aquatic abilities, though he also possesses his mother's ability to create shields, though he does so telekinetically. But Gambit here walks and talks like the Remy of Earth 616, which is kind of weird, but I'm pretty into it. Namor here gives me a kind of ancient Egyptian vibe when it comes to his dress and his darker skin. I just really love this alternate Namor, and I think he and his family are super cool. I'm also just a fan of any reality where Sue and Namor end up together, as yeah, I kind of ship them. Like, I'm not anti, well, I kind of am sometimes anti Reed and Sue, but uh, I'm not anti. Reed and Sue right now, but I just think Namor and Sue's a good couple. You can find King Namor and his family in the new Exile series from 2008. He makes his first appearance in issue number one. Number four, Aquamariner. Aquamariner is the amalgam version of Namor. He's a combination of both Marvel's Namor, the Submariner, and DC's Aquaman. I mean, of course, these two would be combined together. It just makes so much sense as a combo. He first appears in JLX issue number one out of Amalgam Comics. Being a combination of both heroes, he has both of their abilities. In this reality, Namor was once king of Atlantis, but was forced to come to the surface after the destruction of the city Poseidonus in order to protect the oceans from further harm. Arthur McKenzie was one of the founding members of the All-Star Winners Squadron and would go on to join up with the Justice League X-Men, aka the JLX. Number 3, Prime Minister Namor. Although he is only mentioned in issue 15 of the 2001 Exile series, this version of Namor sounds pretty impressive, which is why I included him. And I personally love the idea of him as a character. I hope we actually get to meet him at some point. He is the friend of Mimic who hails from Earth 12. On Earth 12, Namor is the Prime Minister and ruler of Atlantis. He has brought about peace between the surface world and the underwater civilizations. On Earth 12, mutants are accepted and even celebrated being treated as celebrities, as are super superheroes in this reality. Although we never meet him, we do know that Mimic feels really guilty after being forced to kill an alternate version of Namor because of Prime Minister Namor's existence in Mimic's home reality. Number 2, Mr. Nimbus. Ugh. Gosh, I really love this alternate version. People kept telling me after this episode came out that I really needed to watch this this new first episode of Rick and Morty, and boy were they right. I love when two fandoms that I love parody one another or intersect in some way. It's just so cool. And this is definitely a case of that. Mr. Nimbus is Rick Sanchez of Rick and Morty's arch nemesis, and he was definitely created to be a parody of Marvel's anti-hero Namor. Namor himself is underwater royalty and is also known for being a very sexy and stubborn Atlantean, which is exactly the model for Mr. Nimbus's personality who immediately offers the three way to Jerry and Beth upon meeting him and is very fickle when it comes to signing a peace treaty with Rick after he landed in his domain, aka the ocean. I also love that Mr. Nimbus has a horn that grants him extra power. While this doesn't allow him to control sea monsters like Namor's Horn of Proteus, it does grant him even greater strength than he had before. And it's definitely a reference to the Horn of Proteus, in my opinion. Number 1, Captain Namor. Captain Namor is the Noirverse version of Namor's character. In the reality of Earth 90214, Namor works for Tony Stark, venturing out to complete sea voyages for him on his ship, Dorma. Dorma for his ship is obviously a name that is a play on that of Namor's lover, Lady Dorma, from the 616 reality. It makes sense as a captain that his ship would have the name of a woman he loves in the main continuity, as most captains do love their ships well. The Dorma is a unique ship 
in that it appears as a fishing boat, but it, that's actually just a disguise. Dorma is really a submarine, which is pretty crazy for the Noirverse considering the time period. Or well actually, did we have submarines back in uh, the 30s? Probably. Probably we did, but not secret sneaky ones. Kicking off the list at number 10. Zombie Thanos. The opening of Avengers Infinity War showed the Hulk getting beat down by Thanos, but in Marvel Zombies, it's actually the other way around. Earth 2149 Thanos, aka Prunchen, got hit with the zombie plague 40 years after it had started. After this point, he teamed up with the also infected Galactus at the edge of the known universe, good spot to hang out, and then he was still upset at the Hulk in this comic, and he was mad that the Green Goliath had eaten more than his fair share. Like when you split nachos with your buddies at a bar and then you get stuck with the dry ass disregarded chips, it's not cool, definitely a fight's gonna happen. Especially having the appetite of a zombie. So Thanos gets in the Hulk's face and the Hulk literally claps his head to smithereens and then he says now there's a reason to eat for two. That's the darkest thing I've ever heard. But before we go into some other powerful versions of Thanos, if you wanna lighten the mood a little bit after that last one, maybe click that thumbs up. That would be amazing, because those clicks really do go a long way for us here at the studio. You're the best, now back to the Titan. Number nine. Captain America Thanos. In What If Infinity, released back in 2015, we see Thanos join the good side. Okay, a little bit better start this time around. Cap's shield never looked so small before, wow. So how the hell did this happen? Well, when the builders were threatening the universe, Emperor Jason convinces the Avengers to go and team up with the Great Titan. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful, wonderful idea? So Thanos is evil in most of these realities, so he did have a trick up his sleeve. So once Captain America realized Thanos was just using them to free his son from the builders, Thanos killed Cap and then took his vibranium shield. He killed them and then robbed him. How rude. He then told the rest of the team that Cap lost his life protecting the galaxy whilst fighting the builders and that the shield was passed along to him in order to carry on. What a liar. And the Avengers are like, okay. They believe him, and the issue ends with Thanos himself yelling, Avengers assemble. Oh, my heart. He had us in the first half. Number eight, Ultimate Thanos. First appearing in Ultimate Fantastic Four issue 35, Thanos in the Ultimate Universe is a ruler of the Endless Resurgence, this empire on a planet Acheron, which is also consisted of thousands of other worlds on other planes of existence. So he's overlooking a lot of stuff, basically. A little bit more powerful than a vibranium shield this time around, that's for sure. Before all this ruling, that cosmic cube ended up landing on this planet. Thanos did find it and he used it to dominate the will of any being who dared to oppose him. His psychic powers give him the ability to know all the events happening star systems away. He knows all. He's like Santa Claus but a little bit more jacked and a little bit more purple and scary. Ultimate Thanos resembles Jack Kirby's dark side. I mean even looking at him is terrifying. He can control your mind too even being that far away. He can use your body as a vessel you know until his mind gets tired and then he just leaves you to die on your own. Plus the ability to rise from the dead, I mean, this list is just starting to get intimidating. My god. Number seven, Thanos side. I mean, sure, that last version may have looked like Dark Side, but imagine if the two villains merged. Well, trouble ensues. Back in the 90s, Marvel and DC joined forces in the Amalgam Universe was born. Super Soldier was Captain America and Superman, which is quite the combo. But then there's also Thanos side. He was the proud ruler of Apocalypse, and his main goal, of course, was to wipe out the entire universe, find the anti-life nullifier, and win over Lady Death. Sounds like a flawless plan, easy peasy. Now he wasn't alone during his quest, he did team up with the evil Dr. Doomsday during Secret Crisis to wreak havoc across the cosmos. To see the evil dictator in action, start with bullets and bracelets, issue one. Number six, Poison Thanos. In our last video, we talked about the Hulk mixed with Venom, and it was pretty terrifying, but now we get to take a look at Venom Thanos, aka Poison Thanos. Less green, but definitely more mean. First appearing in Edge of Venomverse, issue two, this race of symbiotes called the Poisons were just infecting everybody, heroes, villains, anybody with power, they're a fan of that, they wanted that, they wanted to suck that power from them. They all lived in the hive, comfortably, where a poison Thanos ruled over them. In any version, he always likes to rule. Doesn't matter, even if he's all poison and gooey. He was the second in command, and once Thanos sent out a battalion of poisons, he learned about the multiverse and its existence, and of course, now that he knew about it, he wanted to conquer it. This guy just doesn't stop. Number five, Eric Magnus. What if Magneto could build his own metal robot army? That's kind of what this character is about. Eric Magnus is the Amalgam Universe version of Magneto. He possesses a genius level intellect and the powers of 616 Magneto being a sort of combined version of DC's 
DC's Doc Magnus and Marvel's Magneto. In this reality, however, Eric had a brother named Will. While Eric's abilities would manifest in his teens and inspire him to create his own group known as the Brotherhood of Mutants, his brother Will, now terrified of Eric, would use his smarts to create Sentinels, which would go on to destroy Magneto's team, with him being the lone survivor. In retaliation, Magneto would create his own robots to combat his brothers, known as the Uncanny Magnetic Men, whose sole purpose was to protect mutants and destroy the Sentinels. Number 4 Ultimate Although he was ultimately defeated by Revelation and Logic, as well as a powerful optic blast from Cyclops, Magneto here accomplished a lot of awful stuff before he was apprehended. In the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610, Magneto was a villain due to his hatred of the human race and his desire to dominate and rule over them. He believed basically that Homo Superior are just that, superior, and should rule over humankind, the Homo sapiens of Earth. He was the driving force behind Ultimate which caused so much death, including the deaths of pretty much almost all of the X-Men. However, in the end, he was stopped when he learned that mutants weren't really the next step in evolution, but simply happened as the result of years of experimentation with the Super Soldier Serum, which among other things also created mutants. Learning that his whole philosophy was built on a lie pretty much destroyed Magneto, giving Cyclops the opportunity to take him out. Number 3 Age of Apocalypse In the reality of Earth 295, Magneto becomes the leader of the X-Men after Charles Xavier dies at the hands of Legion before he was able to ever form the team. Magneto here is the one responsible for defeating Apocalypse, and while he didn't save everyone in his final stand against Apocalypse, he was celebrated as a hero by all of humanity who thought what was actually the work of a near-dead Phoenix Force empowered Jean Grey was actually Magneto's doing. So not only is he immensely powerful here as a leader and a mutant, but he's also celebrated as a hero by the people, enhancing his influence even more. Number 2 Onslaught Onslaught is definitely one of the most powerful Magneto alternates out there. Technically, this version of Magneto does hail from the main continuity, but he is also both Magneto and not Magneto, which is what makes him an alternate, basically. Onslaught is made up of the combined consciousness of both Magneto and Professor X. So if you ever wondered what would happen if you put these two together, the answer is something immensely terrifying that threatens the existence of all heroes across the universe, aka Onslaught. Number 1 Brother Mutant Brother Mutant is a version of Magneto that came about after the female alternate Magneto from Earth 127 attempted to take Wolverine's adamantium for herself. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, her plan failed, resulting in the combined superpowered beings becoming something new. Brother Mutant is a being made out of Wolverine, Magneto, Scarlet Warlock, Quicksilver, and Mesmero combined. This alternate version of the characters therefore possess all their collective abilities, making them uh, pretty OP. Number 10 Batman Earth 1 Jeff Johns' and Gary Frank's Earth 1 is not to be confused with the Earth 1 of the Silver Age, which is a different alternate reality from their version. Why we have two Earth 1s, even if one no longer really exists, I have no idea, but here we are. This alternate version of Selena Kyle is much less experienced than many of the other versions listed here, which is why she ranks lower on our list. But what she lacks in experience, she definitely makes up for in sass, moxie, and determination. Don't count her out because if you do, she'll likely come right back and surprise you, leaving you incapacitated and without your valuables. Still, she is just a very acrobatic woman in a cat mask at the end of the day, with of course, a whip. Number 9 2004 Live Action Catwoman Although this movie left much to be desired when it came to its execution, and well, many things about it, we cannot deny that Patience Phillips Catwoman is pretty powerful. She might not have the thieving and fighting experience of the standard Catwoman we're used to, but she has superhuman cat-like agility and other powers that liken her to a cat, which can be good because stealth and perhaps multiple lives, even though cats don't actually have the power to resurrect themselves or regenerate generate. But it can also be bad when it means that patience also sometimes has to act like a cat. Not so useful in battle if someone happens to toss some catnip her way. Number 8 Cat Girl In the reality of Earth 31, Carrie Kelly, once Batman's sidekick Robin, takes up the mantle of Cat Girl in Batman The Dark Knight Strikes Again. As Cat Girl, Kelly is as determined as ever, and while she isn't an alternate Selena, she is an alternate version of Selena's vigilante role, Catwoman. Carrie Kelly is a skilled and adept 
adept fighter and tracker and uses her abilities to seemingly kill a new Joker who appears on the scene, tearing him limb from limb after Green Arrow is incapacitated. The last time we saw Carrie Kelly in this world, she had taken up the mantle of Batwoman, but there was a time that she broke away somewhat from her part in the Bat family to instead act as a new version of Catwoman in Selina's place. In between her time as Robin and her time as Batwoman. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want more Catwoman lists, which I mean, who doesn't want more Catwoman? She's awesome. Be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number seven, 2012 Dark Knight Rises. This alternate version of Catwoman comes to us from the mind of the Nolan brothers, with Chris and Jonathan Nolan both writing the screenplay based around a story made in part with the contribution of David S. Goyer. Anne Hathaway brought this version of Catwoman to life, which had a costume and look that appeared to pay tribute to both Julie. Newmars and Eartha Kitt's version of the character from the 60s live action Batman show. Dark Knight Rises Catwoman has a bit of an edge in comparison to some of the others. Not only is she a master thief and a skilled combatant, but she is also completely fine with using guns and killing her opponents. <gasps> Something her and Batman definitely disagree over. Number six, Earth 2 Golden Age. Or we can just say Earth 2, really. You can say Earth 2, it's in the Golden Age. You know what I'm saying. Golden Age Catwoman hails from Earth 2 and was the first iteration of the character from what was originally considered the main continuity but was later shoved aside and classified as an alternate Earth. This version of Catwoman would start out as a ruthless thief and villain who would eventually become a reluctant ally, full blown ally, and eventually lover and wife to Batman, aka Bruce Wayne. Together she and Batman would have a daughter, Helena Wayne, but sadly Catwoman after retiring would be blackmailed back into a life of crime and would lose her life in the process. Catwoman of Earth 2 was a master of stealth, disguise and thievery and was known for being a skilled fighter and acrobat and even at one point boasted of her own vehicle, the Catmobile or kitty car. Catwoman made her vehicle with the intention of having a car that would outperform Batman. Batman's Batmobile. Number five, Thanos clone. When Thanos appears in She-Hulk Volume 2, Issue 13, titled Minefield, you'd think it would be the end of the world, or the end of a world in general somewhere. That's usually how these interactions go, but when Jed notices Thanos is acting a little off, she volunteers to enter his mind. She gets Moondragon to send her in and see if Thanos is telling lies about this testimony. Moondragon warns Jen, however, that this place, these mind trials, are the purest of psychic planes. So like Nightmare on Elm Street, if you die in there, you also die in real life. Shock. Horror. The fear. She gets in, physical body is moving well, but Thanos feels her presence in his mind. A massive dream fight takes place, well rather a massive beatdown takes place. An evil version of Thanos, but definitely not the strongest. Number four, Omega Thanos. Moving on to a bit bigger version of Thanos, appearing in the Infinity Abyss storyline, Omega, or Armor, was a clone Thanos created in order to go toe to toe with possible enemies. He needed a big bad bodyguard or four, but these clones weren't cutting it. They were considered a failure with their destructive qualities, although it's pretty on the nose with Thanos. But when a meteor freed all these clones, they all thought, well, we're out, let's just work together and end the universe ourselves. Okay, let's do it, gang. They thought Adam Warlock was the secret ingredient, so they schemed and fought other heroes. But this Omega Thanos, he was just looking for a midnight snack. He would much rather build up his own power and feed off planets. I mean, that's the Galactus way. Omega Thanos died in space after following at Lisa Landgun to another planet. And once there, Thanos Thanos teleported everybody back to Earth while remote control ships rained fire on the big bad. Number three, Mystic. Also appearing in the 2002 Infinity Abyss storyline, Mystic, you could probably guess is a clone of Thanos with a magical touch. Thanos, but he meditates. Perfect. What could go wrong? So again, this clone, as well as others, were considered a failure, but when they were all out and broken free, they each had their own plan of attack. Energy trails appeared all around Earth, so Mystic and some other clones went to investigate. Mystic is actually the one that sent Omega Thanos to stop Gamora from teaming up with real Thanos. That's why we had to include them when we are talking about the clones, without going too deep into the cloneverse. So Mystic went head to head with Doctor Strange and Adam Warlock, and let's be honest, he didn't stand a chance. As cool as the Mad Titan Supreme sounds, it's still no match for Strange. Number two, 
Taraxia. First appearing in issue 3 of Infinity Gauntlet, Taraxia was created by Thanos himself. Right after Death had turned her back on the Mad Titan, he needed something to do with that Infinity Gauntlet, so he made himself a partner, an equal. When the Avengers arrive to Thanos' space palace in the following issue, we see what she's capable of, and it's nothing short of terrifying. She beat Spider-Man to death with a rock and then took the head off of Iron Man. She remained alive until issue 5. Nebula took the gauntlet from Thanos, undid all that death the Mad Duo had done, and then teleported them both back into deep space. Thing is, when Thanos was making his weird science girlfriend, he forgot to include the whole breathing in space feature, so she died quickly. Thanos has a weird 15 seconds here. He's like, ah, oh, damn, my partner's dead. I'll be alive though, floating in space, alone. I guess I'll have time to reflect, and then right away he gets sucked through a portal. No time to mourn whatsoever. And finally, coming in at number one, Endgame Thanos, AKA 2014 Thanos. This is the Mad Titan before he got the space and power stone, or well, all the stones, and then snapped away half the universe. When we see him in Infinity War, he's already got two out of the six stones, but not this time around. The last time we saw the space stone was over two years ago, earlier in Thanos' time, when Loki attacks New York. So Thanos doesn't even have a gauntlet yet because he seems almost more powerful without it. With the stones, Thanos is cocky. He tricks the Guardians while he gets the reality stones. He monologues in their faces. He's walking around. In Endgame though, he has the sword, he's wearing armor, and he's determined as hell still at this point. The stones are about to be literally handed to him and he's not going down without a fight. He breaks Cap's shield, he pushes Stormbreaker, into Thor's chest and then he grabs an infinity stone with his bare hands. He's absolutely nuts. He's committed, but he's nuts. Number 10, The Grand Inquisitor. This alternate version of Magneto comes to us from the reality of Earth 311, the 1602 reality. Here Magneto is known as Enrique, or by his title as the Grand Inquisitor. It is his job to hunt down and kill any witch breed that he finds. Witch breed in this reality is the name used for mutants. The Grand Inquisitor does as is expected, but secretly saves the witch breed who can pass off as human, only killing those who are very obviously mutated. More often those who have physical mutations which they cannot hide. Due to his clout and title, the Grand Inquisitor is a dangerous character who also holds a lot of power. Number 9, Earth 1. Did you know that there is also a one-off Aquaman villain from Earth 1 named Magneto? True story. This version of the character who shares the same name with the Marvel villain and anti-hero was a villainous robot who appeared in Aquaman issue 36 in 1967. DC's villainous robotic Magneto also had the power of magnetism, which allows them to manipulate and control their colleague, the Claw. Together, Torpedo Man, Claw, and Magneto made up the villainous team known as the Awesome Three. While the Awesome Three were ultimately defeated, making this version of Magneto sound pretty tame, Aquaman did remark that he really wouldn't want to tangle with their ilk or their weird alien pal again in the future. And he got his wish, because I'm pretty sure they never really reappeared ever again despite promising to do so. Also, I feel like the team name Awesome 3 definitely makes them sound not like a villainous team. Awesome 3. Number 8, Mutant X. In this reality, Magneto is actually a hero who was good friends with Charles Xavier and worked together with him but was forced to turn against his friend after a fight with Shadow King left him changed. During the fight, Charles had absorbed the evil essence of Shadow King, which later caused him to accidentally kill Moira McTaggart, who Magneto was in love with. Magneto was unable to forgive his friend and decided to rule the X-Men alone, creating a divide in the team. His roster included Polaris, Quicksilver, Nightcrawler, Rogue and Mystique. In the Mutant X reality of Earth 1298, Magneto would be one of the last heroes left standing and fighting on. Number 7, Earth Z. In the Marvel Zombies reality, Magneto is a proper badass who ends up managing to fight on against the zombies for quite some time. He also has multiple opportunities to leave and save himself, but proves to be a real hero hero who would rather ensure or avoid risking the safety of many in exchange for putting himself in peril. And it is because of this that he eventually is taken down, bitten, and transformed. Zombie Magneto. Before that, however, he helped to save the Ultimate Universe and chose to refuse help from the Acolytes in order to ensure their safety as survivors. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it where we talk about Magneto, the master of magnetism, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. 
Number 6. Earth X Magneto in this reality at a time was very powerful, but then also went the other way later on. Here Magneto was a savior for mutants who fought off the Sentinels. At this time, Sentinels were activated in order to round up all mutants, including burgeoning ones created unknowingly by Terrigen Mists, which had been released into Earth's atmosphere. Magneto tricked the Sentinels into pursuing him into the Savage Land, whose climate had actually iron rich air, which Magneto was able to use to defeat the Sentinels making a safe haven for all mutated folks, new and old, called Sentinel City. However, while this shows how powerful this version of Magneto could be, for a time he had his powers swapped with Toad, though later this was resolved and Magneto would get his powers back. Number 5. Jessica Dent Jessica Dent is the twin sister of Harvey Dent from Batman Earth 1. After Harvey Dent dies in this reality in a riot, Jessica develops a dissociative identity disorder, creating a new, more aggressive and violent persona meant to be a stand-in by her mind for Harvey. This persona, in fact, goes by the name of Harvey Dent. Jessica initially worked with her brother and with Bruce Wayne, her close friend, to put a stop to the Penguin and his criminal empire. She would go on to become the mayor of Gotham them after the penguin was defeated, but would lose her sanity and become a villain following the death of her brother. Jessica of course never explicitly goes by the name Two-Face, but it is clear from her character direction that she's meant to be a version of Two-Face in this reality. Batman Forever Tommy Lee Jones plays the very colorful and extravagant Two-Face in Batman Forever. I always forget too that it's Tommy Lee Jones. What a character. I personally love him as Two-Face. In Batman Forever, Two-Face is known for having sort of a split personality disorder or a disassociative identity disorder. There's his good side and his bad side and each has their own distinct style and even their own romantic partner, with Two-Face being shown as having two very different girlfriends. The reason he turns to his coin to make decisions in this reality is because because he believes that acting from emotion actually betrays true justice. Better to leave it up to the fates to decide how to act and which version of him gets to be in control. However, his obsession with the coin flip and chance also ends up being kind of his downfall here. Batman tosses up multiple coins during Harvey's coin toss, and in his confusion as he tries to find his own coin in mid-air, Harvey plummets to his death. So there you go. You can't, as a villain, get too obsessed with your trope. If that happens, it's all downhill from there. Or ego. I would say those are the two things you gotta watch out for if you want to be a supervillain. Number 3. DCAU Harvey Dent in the DC Animated Universe is voiced by Richard Maul. Here the character is the best friend of Bruce Wayne, and we also see him early on become a victim of Poison Ivy as she attempted to seduce him in her civilian identity as Pamela Isley, while really seeking to poison him as part of a revenge plot for the near extinction of the wild thorny rose plant. Harvey here, before he even becomes Two-Face, also is plagued by a disassociative identity disorder, with another more rage-filled and dangerous persona lurking deep within him that is referred to as Big Bad Harv. Big Bad Harv surfacing can actually result in blackouts for Harvey, where he doesn't really remember what happened, but also it appears so rarely that it's never really been considered a huge problem for him. At least in the beginning, <laughs> obviously. Once he's Two-Face, um, might be a problem. Number 2. Harvey Kent Harvey Kent is one of the alternate versions of Two-Face, who comes to us from Earth number 2. This version of Harvey, although the actual original appearance of the character in Detective Comics issue 66 in 1942, was actually wiped away from main continuity with the Crisis on Infinite Earths event. Harvey Kent was also sometimes known as Harvey Dent, and his backstory is similar to his main continuity counterparts. He was a great criminal lawyer who had acid basically thrown on him by Sal Maroney. However, a few times Batman actually managed to get Two-Face to turn back to the side of good, and at one point he even has plastic surgery which allows him to resume his old life since his criminal desires were pretty much directly linked to his appearance and happened as well as a result of his love, Gilda, leaving him because of his disfigurement. Don't worry, he and Gilda do get married. Although I feel like if someone left me because I got disfigured, I probably wouldn't want to get back with that person, I'd be like, wow, that's, that's kind of shallow, but okay. I mean, I like things that look nice too, but can you see beyond my disfigurement to the beauty inside? Apparently Gilda could not. 
Number one, The Dark Knight. Aaron Eckhart was the actor who played hotshot district attorney Harvey Dent in Chris Nolan's Dark Knight film. After being disfigured in an explosion that kills his love, Rachel, Harvey is driven to madness in a life of chance-based crime by the Joker after he pays him a visit at the hospital and basically preaches to Harvey about chaos. We see a man who goes from making his own luck with a two-headed coin that he often flips for show when it comes to making decisions to a man who lets fate decide with him now flipping his two-headed coin that is burnt on one side to help him figure out whether he should do something good or something bad. All in all, it's a pretty neat depiction of the character in Aaron Eckhart as Harvey Dent and Harvey's arc in this story is a part of what makes the Dark Knight film so good. I know we all talk about the Joker a lot, but Two-Face is also really good in this movie. Also, Aaron Eckhart, I need to watch more movies with you. I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. How are you? Are you good? What are you up to? Actually, I did check <laughs> Aaron Eckhart's IMDb when I was writing this because I was like, what? How have I not seen this person in so long? And he is still working quite a bit, so I just need to go back and watch some things with Aaron Eckhart in it. There you go. Number 10, Alchemex. Alchemex is the villainous corporation that exists in the alternate future of 2099, Earth 928. It is where Miguel O'Hara once worked and came up with the procedure that would ultimately grant him his powers. He was a brilliant geneticist that worked for Alchemex, but didn't like that he was being pressured to rush along his research and begin trials that he believed were unethical. When Miguel tried to leave Alchemex after a test subject died from the procedure, the CEO, Tyler Stone, attempted to prevent him from leaving by getting him addicted to a drug only Alchemex produced called Rapture, which is also apparently a highly addictive substance, so not so great for Miguel. Fortunately, Miguel would end up curing himself, getting spider-like powers, and end up escaping Alchemex, at least for the time being. Alchemex and Stone, however, weren't willing to let him escape so easily, and they would continue to pursue him. It's possible Alchemex could end up being the main big bad of it all in Across the Spider-Verse Part 1, and maybe Part 2, and however many other parts there will be. Number 9, Vulture. While I imagine we will get to see some of Miguel O'Hara's villains as we head to the future of 2099, I would also love it if we get to meet some of Spider-Man Noirs as well. In the reality of the Noirverse, Earth 90214, Vulture is actually a terrifying villain who Spider-Man Noir also has a pretty personal vendetta against. In that reality, Vulture is the one who is personally responsible responsible for killing Peter's Uncle Ben. He was ordered by the Green Goblin of the Noirverse to do this, but still, he was ultimately the one responsible. Vulture here is a carnival geek. That is a person who travels around with a carnival and not having any particular skill sets of their own, usually performs by biting the heads off of live animals. Vulture went down this road and ended up with a very acquired taste for human flesh. As such, he devoured Peter's Uncle Ben. Later on, Spider-Man Noir would kill the Vulture for what he'd done, when he later attempted to kill his Aunt May. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about more amazing multiversal villains and just, you know, spider villains in general, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. And let us know if there's anyone in particular you want to learn more about. Number 8, The Lizard. The Lizard of Earth 65 is the version we are talking about here. On Earth 65, the same reality that Spider-Gwen hails from in the comics, Lizard is actually none other than Peter Parker. Peter Parker is best friends with Gwen Stacy, and after she becomes the spider-like superpowered hero in this reality, in his place, he wants nothing more than to be like her. He does not know, of course, that this hero, his hero, is actually his friend Gwen. Done with being bullied and having to have Gwen stick up for him as well, he creates a serum which he uses on himself. It gives him power, but it also turns him into the monster and villain known as Lizard. As his reptile self takes over. The lizard ends up dying when he comes up against Spider-Gwen and is only then revealed to be Peter Parker, Gwen's best friend. He dies in her arms. It's all pretty tragic. We saw an allusion to this part of Gwen and Peter's stories from Earth-65 in Gwen's origin flashback and in Into the Spider-Verse. But what if Peter didn't die? What if he's still alive and he somehow returns? That would be intense for Gwen to deal with. Perhaps he's an alternate of this alternate who is still alive, or perhaps, like I said, the lizard didn't didn't really die in Gwen's universe. There are multiple approaches you could take here. I personally would love to see him come back because I just would love to see their dynamic. Number 7, Ultimatum. Ultimatum is actually an alternate and evil version of Miles Morales in the comics who hails from the main continuity of Earth 616. You see, in the comics, Miles is actually not from the main continuity, not originally, but instead from an alternate universe, the universe of Earth 1610, known as the Ultimate Universe, because that was the line of comics that it was a part of. The Ultimates themselves were actually a superhero team 
akin to Earth 616's Avengers. On Earth 616, Miles Morales was a criminal who ended up traveling for a time to Earth 1610. When he returned home to Earth 616, he learned that Miles Morales of 1610 was also residing there, resentful of the other Miles Morales Spider-Man and wanting him out of his way. He aimed to send Miles and his family back to their home reality of Earth 1610 against their will, obviously. Fortunately, Miles and his uncle Aaron Davis, aka Prowler, who also wound up resurrected and on Earth 616, foiled the plot of Ultimatum, defeating him. At least for now. Miles is such a sweetheart in the animated Spider-Verse reality, so I'd really love to see him fight against someone who is very much his opposite. I definitely want to see Miles take on his evil version. Number 6, Peter Parker 2099. In an alternate 2099 future, not the same reality that Miguel is from, Peter Parker actually becomes the CEO of Alchemax, the villainous corporation that Spider-Man 2099 once worked for. In this reality, Peter Parker was still Spider-Man, but allowed the public to believe that the hero was dead. Retired from heroics, he became the CEO of Alchemex, working sort of in secret because you know he's supposed to be dead. His plan was to fix his past mistakes and bring back all of those people whom he couldn't save during his time as Spider-Man. This alternate version of Peter also has a prolonged lifespan due to fancy future anti-aging technology, so that's how he's still alive by the way. He attempts to get Miguel from the alternate 2099 reality, which is I guess really the main 2099 reality, and his own younger self to join him, but both refuse. Prompting 2099 Peter to fight Miguel. This evil version of Spider Man, I think, could fit well into Across the Spider Verse as a main antagonist, considering his whole plot involves rewriting reality, which, you know, could potentially affect and threaten the entire multiverse. 2099 Peter Parker comes from the Spider Man video game Edge of Time, where he was revealed as the main antagonist. Or, well, he ended up kind of being the main antagonist, I guess, at the end of the game. Also, while Edge of Time wasn't well received, and I know that, the story in general was praised. And I I think the story is pretty cool, so yeah, that's just my two cents. At number 5 is the Pyro Nightcrawler Chimera. Imagine a world where Pyro and Nightcrawler's DNA are blended together like a mutant smoothie. Now this flaming hot Chimera finds itself in the company of the Legion of the Night, a group of shadowy teleporting amalgamations created by Mr. Sinister. Their latest escapade involves a rather daring ambush at the Sanctum Sanctorium, but hold on, there's a little bit of a twist. After Vox Ignis uses her scream of change to instill some morals and values into some of the clones, the reformed members of the Legion found themselves in a clash of ideologies with their steadfastly sinister comrades, and the inevitable showdown followed. A brawl that pitted reformation against loyalty, and well, I'm not gonna spoil the ending, but let's just say things got heated, pun intended. At number 4 is Sugar Man. No, he's not a candy enthusiast or a pastry chef. This guy's got a rather unique set of powers that'll make him stand out in the rogues gallery. First up, let's talk about his powerful tongue. Now I know what you're all thinking, how impressive can a tongue really be? You have no idea. Sugar Man's tongue is no ordinary one, it's like a versatile tool of destruction capable of piercing through almost anything. And I mean anything, we're talking stone, steel, and even beings in gaseous or liquid form. But that's not all folks. Sugar Sugar Man could do a bit of size and mass alteration as well. He's got this nifty ability to control his own mass, which means he could shrink down if he wants to, and when he loses mass, he doesn't just vanish into thin air, it apparently gets sent off to some mysterious extra dimensional space. Where exactly? Well, it's anyone's guess. Oh, and injuries are no biggie. He regenerates faster than you can say ouch. He's shrugged off blows that would even make Wolverine winced. Crushed by Colossus boot? No problem. Beaten to a pulp with a metal pipe? back on his feet. Impaled with multiple pieces of metal? Just a minor inconvenience. But here's where things get really interesting. Sugar Man isn't just brawn, he's got brains too. Super genius intelligence in fact, particularly when it comes to all things genetics. At number 3 is Omega World Apocalypse. In the far alternate future of 3167 AD, civilizations crumble, races vanish, and the survivors, the Atlanteans and humans and the Stark Self, Wakandans, Mystics, and Moldoids find themselves under the oppressive rule of Apocalypse in a place called Omega World, a sprawling structure where Apocalypse has essentially become the heart, turning what remained of Earth into what's essentially an extension of his body. His horsemen, now acting as sort of antibodies or white blood cells, would cleanse the Omega World of anything which would cause him harm. Long story short, Apocalypse gets himself a fatal knife to the back by Nightcrawler, causing Omega World to crumble. At number 2 is the Sky Whale Brood Queen. Okay, this one is super weird. So somehow on Earth 13371, Charles Xavier becomes an Akanti Sky Whale. I 
I, I can't even look at it. For those listening, imagine a giant cosmic whale with fleshy skin and a pupilless human face. It's truly a bizarre sight to be seen. But things get even more bizarre as our good old Xavier Sky Whale hybrid gets taken over by none other than the Brood Queen, set out on conquering the Marvel Universe and using Xavier as a vessel to transport her alien brood. Now, despite being telepathically controlled by the Brood Queen, Xavier's mental fortitude allowed him to keep most of his powers a secret from her. After teleporting to Earth 616, the Brood Queen was exterminated by the extreme X-Men. Once freed, Char Whale's Xavier, I like that one, Char Whale's, no, asks Dazzler to end his life as he knew that in this form he was weak and could be dangerous if controlled by a more powerful mind. Get dumped on, Brood Queen. And at number one, is President X. In this alternate universe, Charles Xavier, who never establishes Xavier's school for gifted youngsters, decides to become a politician instead. And yup, that's all it takes for Xavier to become the evil polar opposite counterpart to his 616 version, becoming completely wrathful, cruel, and a statistically megalomaniacal tyrant desiring nothing but total control over everyone around him. Cause remember y'all, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Though he's never revealed to be a mutant himself, it's speculated that Xavier Xavier's telekinetic abilities aided him in tracking down mutants across the nation. A stark contrast to his Earth 616 counterpart, this Xavier exhibited an authoritarian and cruel rule, causing protests notably from billionaire Anthony Stark. The catalyst for change arrived as Stark formed the Avengers specifically to counter Xavier's regime. Unfortunately, Xavier's response proved devastating as a missile targeted the Avengers Quinjet, obliterating its occupants. This tragic loss included iconic figures like Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, and other Wait, Thor? Hold up, he took out Thor with a missile? Oh, okay. With big players gone, Xavier's oppressive reign expanded further with all mutants confined to a grim prison in Texas, subjected to his psychological torment and horrifically abusive tendencies, even torturing some of them to their demise while subjugating the survivors to cruel experiments in an effort to control their mutations for their own good. This dark incarnation of Xavier remains a chilling portrait of power-driven malevolence, unafraid to exercise a ruthless authority. Number 10, Dr. Doom. I love Dr. Doom. He just looks so cute. But of course, this is still a Dr. Doom alternate, so I imagine they're still quite menacing. Dr. Doom is just what he sounds like, an anthropomorphic duck who also happens to have a similar appearance and attitude to Dr. Doom of Earth 616. He makes an appearance as an adversary in the first issue of Peter Porker, The Spectacular Spider Ham. Being a cartoon version of Dr. Doom, aka Victor Von Doom, Dr. Doom also hails from the reality of Spider Spider Hams, Earth 8311. We also learn in his first appearance that against his own will or his own interests, Dr. Doom happens to be a well liked rock star, becoming famous against his wishes. He was trying to create his own rock group and make money off of them, but instead, he ended up in the limelight despite his protests. Number 9, Killer Kravinoffs. The Killer Kravinoffs are the grandchildren of Craven the Hunter from the dystopian post apocalyptic reality of Old Man Logan and Old Man Hawkeye, Earth 807128. With Craven no longer around to hunt, in his place are his grandchildren. There are three of them, but only one ends up actually getting a name. Sadly, their existence in the comics is short lived for how cool they look and should be as descendants of Craven. They only appear in one issue of Old Man Hawkeye, showing up in issue number four. They run into Marshall Bullseye there and actually end up getting killed by him. And friends, before we move on to the next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about even more alternate villains, there are so many alternate Spider-Man villains I could tell you about, so be sure to hit that like button. Number 8, Karn. Karn ends up becoming the Great Weaver, an ally to the spider totems in the end. Spider totems are spider-like superpowered beings who actually receive their powers through fate rather than circumstance, as we were initially led to believe with heroes like Spider-Man. Karn was a member of the Inheritors, a coven of energy vampires who feed on various animal kingdom totems such as the spider variety. Spider totems. After Karn was blamed for the death of his mother, he was made to work to atone his misdeeds. He traveled around various multiverses hunting down spider totems at the behest of the other inheritors, though he never really enjoyed it and thus was a reluctant villain. When the previous Master Weaver ended up dead, Karn decided to take his place and instead became an ally to the spider army as opposed to a villain of theirs. He did however kill spider totems back when he was hunting and working for the inheritors, and a member of the inheritors really. 
Like his fellow inheritors, Karn hails from the reality of Earth 001 and Loom World, which is their home world. Number 7 King Pig King Pig is Spider Ham's version of King Pen. As such, King Pig hails from the same reality of Earth 8311. He is, as you guessed it, one big mean pig, who also happens to be a major crime lord, like his 616 counterpart. However, while King Pen in the comics is more into drug rings and other organized crime, King Pig is into smuggling cheese and running the cheese market. Mmm, now I want cheese. King Pig operated in secret, and despite the police trying to uncover who was behind the crimes in their town of Hakawatomi, Wisconsin, King Pig managed to be too sneaky for them to catch. In the end, it was up to Spider Ham to discover just who was behind all this illegal activity. We already had Kingpin show up as the villain in Into the Spider Verse, so how funny and great would it be to see his Toon counterpart in Across the Spider Verse? Also, I'd really like to go to Spider Ham's like reality if we get a reality hop, which I think we're gonna get to do that. Number six, Goblin. In the noir verse of Earth 90214, Green Goblin's counterpart is simply known as Goblin. Here, Norman Osborn is still a ruthless villain who is the major crime boss in New York and leads his own villainous group known as the Enforcers. The Enforcers are made up of former carnival freaks who each have their own unique talents, featuring characters like the noir versus Vulture and Chameleon. Goblin turned to a life of crime because he was mistreated. Him Himself being a circus freak who was ridiculed for his scaly green reptile like skin. Goblin in the comics is the one who is ultimately responsible for the death of Peter Parker's uncle Ben and for the death of Ben Urich, the reporter and Felicia Hardy's former lover in this reality. Number 5, Carnage 1602. This version of Carnage hails from the reality of Earth 311. What is Earth 311? Well, it is considered to be the comic book home of the 1602 reality. If you aren't familiar with 1602, let me get you up to speed. In this reality, many of the classic heroes and villains we know and love from the present day in the Marvel comic book continuity were sent back in time to come to prominence instead during the year 1602. This was done as part of Kilgrave, the Purple Man's plot to remove Captain America in another timeline where Kilgrave basically became president of the United States. He was like, look, I don't want to deal with Captain America. So rather than killing him and making him a martyr, Kilgrave decided to displace him in time. So instead, heroes like Captain America, Doctor Strange, Nick Fury, Spider-Man, and Black Widow existed way before they would normally back in the past. The version of Carnage that exists there was Canis Cassidy, who claimed to be possessed by a demon. He wouldn't appear in the standard 1602 series, but instead was introduced in an alternate reality story featured in Amazing Spider-Man issue number one from 2015. Number four, Aunt May. Yep, there is an alternate version of both Aunt May and Carnage combined together out there. This version of Aunt May is sadly a lot more evil than her usual self. Or maybe not so sadly if you are into an idea of an evil Aunt May. She appears in the 2019 Spider-Verse comic where she faces off against Spider-Man and Miles Morales. Spider-Man, who is the spider-themed hero of Reality 3123, is forced to channel the power of all her heroic alternates across the multiverse in in order to defeat this version of Carnage. So while she might be Aunt May, that doesn't mean she is any less ruthless or horrifying than say the Cletus Cassidy of Earth 616. Number 3, Spider-Man slash Batman. One of the craziest appearances of Carnage has to come from the crossover comic Spider-Man slash Batman. If you're wondering how these two heroes from two completely different publishers managed to get together in a comic book, the answer pretty much is Amalgam. This is around that time and DC and Marvel were doing a bunch of cool crossover things. Back in the day, Marvel and their distinguished competition were actually a lot more willing to team up if it meant telling cool stories by teaming up cool characters who you'd otherwise never see meet each other. I'm sure the money they made from these crossovers also didn't hurt either. In the Spider-Man slash Batman team up, Cletus ends up seemingly being cured, but has the chip that essentially cured him disabled by his symbiote, returning him back to Carnage. Once free, Carnage kidnaps Joker and basically does the same for him because he was also, you know, cured, proposing that the two of them should team up. Doesn't work out too great, but it's a pretty wild team up idea. Number two, Carnage Cosmic. There was a time when Carnage actually ended up
up going cosmic in terms of his power source and level. The Carnage symbiote at one point jumped ship to Norrin Rad, one of the Heralds of Galactus. While in the main continuity, the bond between them did not last, there is a What If comic that imagines what could have happened had the bond between them remained. In the end, in this alternate reality, in order to prevent Carnage from having too much power and control over him, because Silver Surfer was like struggling, he ended up regaining control temporarily and used that time to hurl himself along with Carnage into the sun, sacrificing himself. However, apparently that wasn't actually the end, as somehow the two of them survived, reappearing again in the 2013 comic Longshot Saves the Marvel Universe issue number three, which I didn't even know was a thing, but apparently it is, and now I'm curious and I kind of want to read it. This happened probably thanks to Silver Surfer's powers and not Carnage, who, you know, is pretty susceptible to fire damage, but maybe the power of cosmic somehow saved them. Number 1. Grendel Symbiote While this is still technically Cletus Cassidy as Carnage, some may consider the Grendel Symbiote to be a different version of Carnage altogether, since the Carnage Symbiote itself at this point in the story is kind of dead and gone. And honestly, so is Cletus. He basically is a corpse that was revived and like put inside a symbiote so he could be brought back to life. And I guess maybe if there's a little bit of blood left in him, Carnage could come back through that. I don't know. He still has consciousness and everything, but I'm not sure if we'd quite call him alive here, and I'm not sure if we'd quite call this, you know, original Carnage. Definitely it's a different version. This version of Carnage is probably one of the most horrifying when you consider its purpose. The Grendel symbiote takes the place of Carnage and is used by Cletus to hunt down all the codices on Earth, which exist inside former hosts of symbiote spines. Acquiring the codices bolsters his own power, with the main goal being to wake up Null, god of the symbiotes, one of the biggest bads around, which is supposed to happen once all the codices have been gathered and combined. Number 10, Essex. This version of Mr. Sinister hails from the Age of Apocalypse reality of Earth 295. AOA, or Age of Apocalypse, was a continuity and reality that was born out of Legion, the son of Charles Xavier, traveling back in time and attempting to eliminate Charles' rival, Magneto. However, Legion instead missed his target, and Charles ended up being the one eliminated instead of Magneto. As a result, Legion eliminated his father and ended up accidentally erasing himself. Here, Essex is an ally to Apocalypse, a somewhat reluctant one though, as he also also attempted to take power for himself when he merged together the genes of Jean Grey and Scott Summers in an attempt to create a supremely powerful mutant being, which he hoped to have under his control. Unfortunately for Essex, in attempting to hide this young mutant named Nathaniel Grey from Apocalypse, he lost track of him and instead, Nate escaped and was found and raised by the Mutant Forge. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know you love us by clicking that like button. Seriously, it's good for you it's good for me. Number 9, Nathaniel Essex. Technically the original Mr. Sinister. This version of Sinister is the OG. Nathaniel Essex is the man Mr. Sinister was before he became the cape-loving, mutant gene-obsessed man, mad science geneticist that we have today. How did he get there? Well, initially Nathaniel Essex was just a scientist obsessed with Darwin's theory of evolution. He believed that it was possible for people to dramatically evolve based on certain factors which he found and, of course, named after himself. The loss of his young son only made him throw himself more into his work, but the academic community did not see or appreciate the value of Essex's findings, believing him to be mad and also quite immoral. And honestly, I can see where they, why they felt that way based on his research. They kicked him out of academia as a result of him not letting up on his beliefs surrounding evolution. He would later run into Apocalypse and decide to become a reluctant ally to the mutant whose very existence proved his theories were true. Number 8, Apocalypse. One of the weirdest but still super brutal versions of Mr. Sinister comes to us from the ultimate continuity and reality of Earth 1610. Sinister has always had his story closely entwined with that of Apocalypse. However, in this comic, he isn't just connected to Apocalypse, he actually becomes Apocalypse. This happens over the course of a few issues after Sinister becomes an enemy to the X-Men, seemingly claiming to be working for Apocalypse, who of course hasn't been seen for years. While some think Sinister is delusional, it's later revealed that he was actually 
telling the truth, and he eventually transforms straight up into Apocalypse at one point. Number seven, Mother Righteous. Mother Righteous is one of the four sinister clones that replaced Essex after his death. She is known as the clone of hearts, thanks to the heart-shaped symbol on her forehead. Unlike the other sinister clones, Mother Righteous is under no illusion that she happens to be the original Mr. Sinister. Instead, she rightfully believes and acknowledges that she is one of four clones that he created before he died. She is the only one of these clones who is a female and she happens to have a very thick accent that is akin but not exactly belonging to East London, but sounds similar to that. Rather than stay based in the realm of science in terms of her purpose to figure out how to solve the evolutionary problem of AI and machines becoming the dominant ruling group in the cosmos, she decided to look into other more mystical means of knowledge, which I think of as another layer to her character that makes her even more unique among all the alternate Sinisters that we've had. Normally you'd never expect a Sinister to be a magic user. And she messes with those expectations that we have for Sinister alternates really beautifully. Number six, Nathaniel Essex. While Mr. Sinister becomes Apocalypse in the Earth 1610 reality, this isn't the only version of Nathaniel Essex that exists in this continuity. In fact, there is another that appears three issues earlier in Ultimate X-Men issue number 46. Initially known as Nathaniel Essex, this version of the character originally worked for Norman Osborn and was working on creating a super soldier as a bioengineer. Not being allowed to run human trials during his time at Oscorp, he ended up using himself as a test subject. Now, he did succeed in acquiring superpowers, but seemingly at the cost of his sanity, believing that a being known as Lord Apocalypse was attempting to reach out and communicate with him, which as I said before, a lot of people thought he was pretty crazy for that. He does, of course, also end up being reborn as Apocalypse eventually, which I already talked about in my previous point, but we already know about that version. After Apocalypse is defeated by Phoenix, Nathaniel Essex's human body is revealed to still be within Apocalypse's form, meaning that technically we kind of have like two versions of Nathaniel, the one that becomes Apocalypse and the one that still remains inside himself and just emerges after. Following the events of Ultimatum, he ends up as a somewhat reformed scientist working for Roxxon Corporation. Number five, what if Doctor Doom had become a hero? In this reality, Victor had a life that was quite similar to his Earth 616 main continuity counterpart, up until the time that he was in university and Reed Richards gave him advice on his experiments. In this reality though, Doom decided to actually take Reed's advice and implement it, avoiding becoming injured and scarred. Victor would then seek Reed's help in reaching out to the afterlife to contact his mother Cynthia. Now the two actually succeeded in doing this and Doom learned that his mother's soul was being tormented in a version of hell. Instead of having a suit of silver metal armor, this version of Doom would acquire a golden suit of armor that was made for him by Tibetan monks. He left his studies in university and set out to study the occult and gain further knowledge of the arcane. He acquired the knowledge needed to save his mother's soul and in doing so became a sworn enemy of Mephisto, in whose hellish realm Cynthia's soul had been trapped. And of course, I mean, even in the main reality, I feel like Doom and Mephisto never really get along, do they? Number four, Dr. Doom. Oh, Dr. Doom. I love Dr. Doom. Just the whole look of this character is fantastic if you ask me. Dr. Doom hails from the reality of Earth 8311, which is the Toon reality that Peter Porker, aka Spider-Ham, is from. What I think I love most about him is that he is Doom, but is also a duck. I don't know why, but I feel like a character like Donald Duck would, or maybe Scrooge McDuck would, make for a good fit when it comes to what his duck persona could or would be like. Dang, now I want more Marvel and Disney classic crossover content. That would be super cool. This version of Dr. Doom is not only a major villain from his universe, but also at one time successfully became a pop music sensation and star. Fun fact. Number three, Sorcerer Supreme. For those who are unaware, Dr. Victor Von Doom has always been in the running to become Sorcerer Supreme. He's considered to be one of the prominent magic users in the running for this position, should we ever need someone to replace Dr. Strange. Kind of both a terror terrifying and exciting prospect. In the reality of Earth 938, as seen in 1989's What If series in issue number 52, we answer the question, what if Doom became Sorcerer Supreme? He becomes a student of the Ancient One here, hoping to find a way to save his mother, Cynthia's soul, after failing to do so on his own. This version of Doom also runs into the alternate reality of Stephen Strange, who still seeks out the Ancient One for help to heal his hands. Doom's response is to basically simply chop them off and replace them completely with robot hands that are even better than Strange's ones once were originally, and causing Steven to simply become a footnote in this alternate Doom story. I love that fix that Doom has. He's just like, why don't we just chop them off, replace them with some robot hands, fixed. 
Number two, 1602. I just love the whole design of Count Otto Von Doom. He looks amazing. I mean, a lot of things in 1602 are well designed, to be honest. This version of Doctor Doom is from the reality of Earth 311, also known as the 1602 reality. Here, the heroes and villains of the Marvel Universe existed much earlier than their comic book counterparts, coming to prominence in the year 1602. In this world, Doom is still the ruler of Latveria and is obsessed with power. Also a villain in this universe, Doom seeks power at any cost and is willing to go to great lengths to remove anyone in his way on the path to getting it. Number one, God Emperor Doom. God Emperor Doom is one of my favorite versions of this character. Technically, technically, he is still part of the main continuity, but also, Technically, that is also an alternate reality that Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four cleaned up. So although it exists as part of the main continuity in a linear sense, it doesn't really exist for Doom anymore. I don't think he'd even remember that any of this happened. God Emperor Doom is a version of Doom who basically ended up ruling all of reality during the 2015 Secret Wars event. How did this happen? Why did this happen? Well, because the incursions were destroying the multiverse, things, universes, Earths colliding with each other. And fortunately, Dr. Doom was able to save everyone by taking the power of the Beyonders and more specifically of Molecule Man, which is how we later find during the event that he's had all this power for himself. He used this newfound power to create a, the patch-like battle world where basically each realm represented a different universe for the most part. However, this world left much to be desired and everyone also seemed to be kind of beginning to realize waking up to the fact that Doom was controlling and manipulating them with um, his power and keeping the truth of what had happened from them. They rebelled and in the end Reed Richards ended up being given Molecule Man's powers. He and the Fantastic Four would then use them to rebuild the multiverse, which is why this world no longer exists. But still happen. It's a thing. All right, coming in at number 10 today is The Reigning. The Reigning storyline happened in Thor Volume 2 from 2003 to 2004, and it basically saw a future where Odin passed at the hands of Surtur, and Thor took his place, but then took Asgard to Earth and essentially put the entire world under his rule for hundreds of years. It created a dystopia where Asgardians were the elite and humans just tried to survive. Loki in all of this played the role of chief advisor and prime minister of the magistrate residing over new Asgard, and he seemed to have become Sorcerer Supreme along the way. Or at least he had Doctor Strange's stuff. But with Thor becoming a shell of who he once was, Loki had been secretly providing, as well as profiting off of, internal strife in order to consolidate power for himself. Classic Loki. He was responsible for slaying Baldur, the Avengers, Scarlet Witch, and Jane Foster. He did a whole heck of a lot more, but he absolutely paid for it before this reality was erased by Thor himself. They denied Crocodile Loki. In this timeline, Loki was either born or turned into an alligator, but you know, of course I'm gonna talk about Crocodile Loki. Not alligator Loki, That's there's a difference. One day, he reportedly ate a neighbor's cat and then was detained by the Time Variance Authority for creating a Nexus event, which caused a detour in their version of the Sacred Timeline, because he wasn't supposed to eat the cat. Oh wait, no, he was supposed to eat another neighbor's cat. Y yeah, apparently that's going to ruin the universe. Uh, he ate the wrong cat. I don't know how that that's possible when it's a sacred timeline, but you know what, that's aside the point. They needed to get the merchandising in there. He was then subsequently pruned and sent to the void where he met Kid Loki, classic Loki, boastful Loki, and yeah, you know, it, it, it's the classic Loki tale, but as a crocodile. Ah. Joyce. As they made their way across the void, uh, Loki demanded an explanation for his current whereabouts, forcing Kid Loki to silence him, <laughs> um, which is just funny, because this freaking alligator could talk, but oh well. Uh, yeah, it, it's Loki, but as an alligator, okay? That's why he's on the list. There's not much more than that. It's just funny. Number eight, Raised by Frost Giants. A perfect what if tale. It's almost surprising it wasn't done before this point. In What If Thor in 2018, we get the story of what if Thor was raised by Frost Giants instead of Loki being raised by Asgardians. Simple, but brilliant. Laufey, the king of the Frost Giants, defeats Odin in their battle super long ago, and just as Odin took the infant Loki, Laufey takes the kid Thor and raises him as his own. Loki is obviously here too and like usual, Thor and Loki form a pretty tight bond as adoptive brothers. Unfortunately though, due to Thor's strength and skill in battle, not to mention his fondness for summoning the power of lightning, he is praised among the Frost Giants and by Laufey himself, who begins to completely forget Loki, his actor 
actual true son. Instead, Loki finds the captured Freya in the dungeons and she teaches him how to use magic. Loki eventually busts her out of prison and together they attempt to escape to Midgard. They go to the ruins of Asgard first and attempt to repair the Rainbow Bridge until Thor and Laufey show up. Loki ends the life of his father while Thor unknowingly ends his mother with a blast from his giant ice hammer, Ice Crusher. Thor almost takes out his brother as well, but at the last minute, he lets him go. We don't know what happens next, only that Loki went to Midgard, had kids and a family, and apparently became a hero. So, yeah. And it's seven Earth X. The entity that would evolve into Loki originated on a distant planet under the manipulation of the Celestials. Through their reproductive methods, the Celestials infused an embryo within Loki's world, altering the genetics of its inhabitants to grant them protective abilities for said embryo. Over time though, Loki and its people underwent various mutations that led them to lose their distinct forms, becoming defined by external perceptions, so it's kind of like an eye is in the beauty of the beholder thing, um, except it's with people. Having fled their planet, they arrived on Earth and encountered the ancient Norse civilization, particularly a storyteller named Donnerson. And he played a crucial role in shaping Loki and the other Asgardians, believing them to be gods of their legends, you know, just on Earth this time. Eventually, Donnerson merged with two Asgardians and assumed the role of Odin, but, but yeah, Loki lost all awareness of his true origins. But like, yeah, yeah, it's it's weird. It's it it's definitely a weird one. Number six, boastful Loki. Not much is known about the history of this Loki for certain, and that's what makes him so intriguing to me. He claimed to have defeated his world's Captain America and Iron Man, and collected all six Infinity Stones. But his tales of exploits were not taken seriously, even by other versions of himself. He also wields a very strange-looking hammer that seems to be made out of a chunk of metal eye beam with a piston rod for a handle. I think that may be the part that has me the most curious of everything about him, to be completely honest. In any case though, he was arrested by the Time Variance Authority and pruned, ending up in the void at the end of time, and he has teamed up with classic kid and alligator Loki, like we talked about before, before he betrayed them, making a deal with President Loki. Spoilers, sorry. <laughs> Halfway through into number five, Sorcerer Supreme. Yeah, you thought that Alligator Loki was scary? What about Sorcerer Supreme Loki? That's true terror. Following his dethronement in the 2017 arc Loki Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange was stripped of his title, his abilities, and his aid Zelma, leading to him becoming a, a veterinarian <laughs> for elderly talking dogs, specifically bats his talking dog. After a failed encounter with Loki uh, resulted in Bats' death, Strange ends up pulling a John Wick and uh, seeks aid from a greater force to, to counter the god of mischief. That's what those movies are about, right? While Loki ranks among Marvel's most supreme magic users, his power alone can't really match Doctor Strange. But man, um, yeah, with, with the Sorcerer Supreme powers, he's, he's just, he's, yeah, he's gonna go kinda nuts. And then, and then, like I said, there's John Wick vengeance and then obviously it doesn't last forever but like yeah uh, Loki with Doctor Strange powers that's going on the list no way that's not going on the list number four Avenger Prime Avengers forever is a true treat for anyone who loves the multiverse and seeing alternate versions of different Avengers it's truly a lot of fun Robbie Reyes the all rider or he was a ghost rider but he became all rider is pulling together this awesome Avengers team that faces up against the doom above all an army of Mephistos and dooms masters of evil the team is super cool, but during a critical battle against multiple versions of Doctor Doom and Mephisto, the multiversal Avengers seem to have no magic users, which is super weird, but then the Avenger Prime comes waltzing out of a portal stating that he is the Prime Avenger because you can't have the Avengers without a Loki to bring them together. And it's Loki as Avenger Prime and it's super cool. This Loki became King of Asgard and a hero and then he discovered the other Lokis in the universe were bad guys who always fought the Avengers. So he made sure his Avengers never existed and fought all of Earth's threats himself, which led to the end of life in his universe, including his own. But then he woke up in the God Quarry where he came into contact with alternate versions of Avengers, creating the Multiversal Avengers and an Avengers Tower inside the God Quarry to run the whole thing. That's all I have to say about that. In at three, D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper is an alias associated with an unidentified man who commandeered Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305, a Boeing 727 airplane. In November of 1971, Loki lost a bet to Thor, and as a result, he had to visit Earth in order to pull off a heist. He hijacked the Northwest Orient Airlines flight, 
305 in the United States under the pseudonym of DB Cooper informed Florence Schaffner that he had a bomb and demanded $200,000 in ransom. To comply with the hijackers demands the plane landed is exchanged passengers on the plane for the ransom money and backup parachutes and then they went back up in the air. Loki then collected the ransom money and uh, proceeded to jump out of the airplane with a parachute only to be transported back to Asgard by Heimdall using the Bifrost bridge leaving only a few $20 bills in his wake which is where the mystery comes comes from because if you don't know DB Cooper jumped out of the plane never to be seen again but they couldn't find a, a body or the briefcase but they found bills in the water somehow so yeah uh, if you were wondering it was Loki at least in the MCU although probably here too we just haven't figured out that they're real yet Number two, Ultimate Loki. Loki Laufey's son in the main Marvel Universe is a pretty dastardly devil. He's always got schemes on schemes and is just doing what gods of mischief do best using his sorcery, but he's also somewhat redeemable. The Loki Odin son of Marvel's Ultimate Universe is kind of just a madman, but one with the ability to warp reality. He could retcon history into anything he desired by either creating events that never happened or erasing events as if they never happened. He could create copies of himself, change the color of the skies, render himself near impervious to harm even from Thor's hammer and summon armies of monsters. One of the first things this Loki does while a member of the Warriors 3 alongside Thor and their brother Baldur is visit his giantess mother, steal the Norn stones and completely take the life of Baldur. He then took on the guise of Baron Zemo during World War II and led an attack on Asgard with frost giants, Germans and some super soldier Germans that he created. This got him banished to the room without doors just like he planned apparently. He was then eventually free from the room and unlike his brothers who had been reborn as mortal men, Loki was still a god and an incredibly powerful one. He would be one of the main threats faced by the Ultimates when they formed but was eventually depowered by Odin. So sucks to suck. Actually pretty sure he came back so I guess it sucks for us. And finally in a number one necro god Loki. If you don't understand why that's number one just from the name alone then yeah I guess I'll explain it. Originating from All Black and the infamous Necroverse, this incarnation of Loki stands as the most formidable and the most badass. Following the closure of er, the, following the closure of Agent of Asgard, Kid Loki and King Loki's narratives, Loki becomes consumed by vengeance against all of life. Uh, yeah, when you're tired of fighting against your brother, why not fight life? In a catastrophic turn though, he orchestrates a cosmic scale level devastation of just everything, binding with all black the Necro Sword by deceiving Ego, the Necro World. He turns Ego into the sword's other end, acquiring immense power, and uh, yeah, notably Necro God Loki clashes with old King Thor, resulting in the extinguishing of the sun, and he ruthlessly wipes out Earth's entire population. Yeah. What the hell? He can also time travel, because why not throw that in there? They're already gonna wipe out Earth. There's no stakes anymore. But yeah, yeah, just. Yeah. Number 10. What if Gwen Stacy had lived? I kind of love this one for Norman Osborn. I mean, he's a complex dude, and while sure, he's usually one of the worst folks out there, I do believe that there is at least some good in Norman. In fact, most of the reason that he tends to even become evil is because of his goblin persona. In What If, issue number 24 from the original series, we answer one of the most often contemplated questions in Marvel Comics history. What if Gwen Stacy had lived? For Peter, this means proposing and getting engaged to the girl of his dreams while also having his secret identity exposed, leaving him trapped in his own city. For Norman though, this leads to a reconciliation with his son Harry that seems to send him towards a permanent path of recovery when it comes to his mental state. So he actually gets a kind of happy ending I guess here. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. And if you're already subscribed, Thank you. Number 9. Green Goblin 2099 Green Goblin 2099 is also known by the name of Galactic Goblin. You might be surprised to hear that this version of Green Goblin is actually still just Norman Osborn. That's right, Norman in this version of the story survives till the year 2099. Although, to be clear, this isn't the same 2099 potential future that Miguel O'Hara hails from, known as Earth 928. Instead, this alternate future is known as Earth 2099. To maintain his youth, Norman utilized the Green Goblin serum as well as his descendants, basically sacrificing them to keep himself young. Number 8. Mongaverse Yep, Norman also has an alternate that exists in the Marvel Mongaverse 
universe. Oh boy, if you can believe that. The mangaverse is exactly what it sounds like a Marvel reality where everything is mangafied from the stories to the characters to the dialogue, right down to the art. At least, that's the intention here. The Earth is known as Earth 2301. Norman Osborn here is still the head of Oscorp, but is also a leader of a group known as the Graffiti Ninja, who he uses to help him carry out his less than legal business in the world of crime. I'm not entirely sure, but I think this group is similar to the Shadow Clan in this universe, in that they are also, I think, a bunch of ninjas. They would also be attached to the mystical world through their connection to Norman as well, who in this reality possesses magic and magical abilities, basically acting as like a sorcerer. Green Goblin can also don his mask in this reality to summon demons, which also increases his power levels. Number 7. The Fairy Gob Mother Oh my goodness, I just love the whole design and idea behind this character, so cool. This version of Norman Osborn hails from The Edge of the Spider-Verse comic, which I already knew I needed to read and get caught up on, but now I definitely need to do that ASAP because this character just has me being like, I need to read this story. The Fairy Gob Mother is known as Norma, and in her universe of Earth 423, she is the godmother of Princess Petra, who actually inherits her spider-like powers from making a deal with Norma, with Petra becoming the hero known as Spinstress. I gotta say, the design for both of these characters is straight fire. We really only see the fairy godmother in the 2022 Edge of the Spider-Verse series in issue number 4, and then once more again in the 2023 Edge of the Spider-Verse in issue number 2. At least thus far. But I'm hoping we might see more of this character and Princess Petra as time goes on. Number 6. Goblin God This is the version of Green Goblin who hails from the MC2 reality of Earth 982. For those who are unfamiliar with this Earth, this is an alternate reality where Peter and Mary Jane were actually permitted to grow up, settle down, get married, and stay married, and ended up having a family. It's a legacy based world where heroes actually age and retire with time actually moving forward and their kids and other young heroic protégés taking over. Goblin God in this reality took Peter and MJ's daughter but did not harm her and instead ended up cloning her. In a final fight against Spider-Man, Peter lost his leg and Norman presumably lost his life, having been in the crossfire of one of his own pumpkin bombs. His grandson, Normie Osborn, goes on to become the new Green Goblin here, initially starting out as a villain but quickly becoming sort of an ally and confidant to Spider-Man's daughter, May, who is also known as the hero Spider-Girl and later as Spider-Woman. Number 5. Orbis Stellaris Orbis Stellaris is another of Mr. Sinister's clones. Clones. This clone actually has some reason to believe they are the original Sinister, considering they actually do look the most like the original Nathaniel Essex. However, even this clone is still not he. Orbis Stellaris is more obsessed with solving the evolutionary problem of AI and machines conquering the Earth by looking to the stars. This clone is known as the Clone of Spades, thanks to the mark on his forehead. And he focuses more on alien life forms and DNA and cosmic computing, believing that through this research, he will be the one to solve the evolutionary problem presented to him by the original Essex. Number 4. House of M Mr. Sinister also had a role to play in the House of M reality and timeline. Here, he is still sporting a super amazing cape and possibly an even more insane pair of gauntlets and an even more wild and extreme collar than ever before. He is very much rocking the metallic look here. Sinister in this reality is focused on playing catch up as the mutant population has defied all of his estimates, growing even bigger than he imagined it would be at this current point in history. Probably because Scarlet Witch willed it to be so, as this was a reality that was created and manipulated by her. Hence why he would have never predicted this happening. In an attempt to catch up, Sinister creates a mutant child who he hopes will one day become the heart, soul, and savior of the entire planet. The child's name? Nathan, of course. Number 3. Dr. Stasis Dr. Stasis was the first of the four clones of Sinister, outside of the clone of Diamonds, aka Mr. Sinister, who this list is based around that we'd come to know. We always thought Mr. Sinister was Nathaniel Essex, but it turns out even he was a clone. And in fact, there were others out there that were actually made at the same time, each representing a different suit in a deck of cards. Dr. Stasis is known as the clone of clubs, marked by the symbol on his forehead. He is determined to solve the evolution problem of AI and machines rising to ultimate power above all other species and groups by using human experimentation. While Mr. Sinister focuses more on mutant DNA, Stasis focuses instead on human DNA. He actually even thinks mutants are like kinda gross. 
He's like, I'm all about humans, baby. Number two, Baron Sinister. One of my favorite versions of Sinister, especially in terms of his look, but also in terms of his behavior. I always imagined this Sinister very much with my Sinister voice. Hmm, it's me, Mr. Sinister. This version of Sinister is the alternate version who hails from Doctor Doom's smashed up patchwork reality known as Battle World. Battle World came to be after the incursions came to a conclusion with every universe basically smashing into one another in the Marvel multiverse, thereby destroying them all and all of their inhabitants. Doom was the one to save the Marvel multiverse from certain destruction by confronting the Beyonders and ultimately becoming the ruler of this new world, using an insane amount of reality warping power taken from Molecule Man to reform everything and basically like hold it together. Baron Sinister is the version of Sinister he created who rules over his own dimension in God Emperor Doom's battle world, which is known as Bar Sinister. Number one, Mr. Sinister. Mr. Sinister himself. As in Nathaniel Essex, and with him, the original Mr. Sinister that he became is now long dead and gone. Technically, even Mr. Sinister is an alternate. Although at this point, based on how much we've seen him, now that we know the full retcon history of his other clones' origins, he would be considered the original in terms of just how much he appears in the comics as the main Essex and Sinister, but he isn't. However, yeah, that being said, the Mr. Sinister we know from the comics himself could even be a clone as it's become unclear how many times Sinister has cloned himself and even he seems to be uncertain at times if he is the original or if he's a clone. And even then, he's technically a clone of another clone. You know what I mean? It's just clones on clones on clones. Number 10, the spider. The spider is basically an alternate version of Carnage that combines his character with that of Spider-Man's Peter Parker. He made his first appearance in Exiles issue number 12 in 2002 and hails from the reality of Earth 15. Here, the spider is not a hero, but a villain who was incarcerated for his crimes. Like Cletus, the spider was also a redhead and also a mass murderer. What is it with redheads being presented as murderers or folks who are prone to extreme darkness in stories? He possessed the same powers as Earth 616's Carnage, but also combined with Spider-Man's powers, making him potentially even more deadly. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know by clicking that like button. Seriously, it does help us out. Number nine, Avengers Alliance. When it comes to the Carnage from Avengers Alliance, there are quite a few people that love this version of Carnage. Really, he's pretty much still the same old classic Cletus Cassidy, but I think the design and artwork here is what puts people over the moon for him in the game, or in the game that used to exist. Also, I think most people just miss the days of the Avengers Alliance game, since that game is no longer active. In the game, Carnage was firmly established as being more powerful as both Venom and Spider-Man, and even the two of them combined. While Avengers Avengers Alliance is no longer available to play after being shut down in 2016, Marvel Strike Force is available and is also a turn-based strategy game with its own carnage, if you are one of the folks who missed the Alliance days. Honestly, it sounds like Marvel Strike Force is basically like what replaced it. Number eight, Maximum Carnage. Carnage has become so iconic as a character that obviously he doesn't just exist in the comics and the animated series and even in live action. He also has shown up in various video games as well, including the Maximum Carnage video game from way back in the 90s. Yeah, he's been doing video games for a long time. Oh boy, what a time that game was. This side-scrolling adventure had you playing as the various heroes from the comics in an attempt to take down villains Carnage, Shriek, Demogoblin, Doppelganger, and Carrion. The game, like the comic book storyline of the same name, is iconic, beginning with Carnage's escape from prison and with him teaming up with Shriek. They then go on to run into Doppelganger, who they kind of adopt into their group, with Shriek kind of treating Doppelganger like uh, he's their child. Carnage here decides to go on the offensive after his escape from prison, hoping to take his fight in this side-scrolling world straight to Spider-Man and Venom. And that's where you as the player come in, obviously. Number seven, Let There Be Carnage. Was Woody Harrelson a weird choice in terms of the casting of Cletus Cassidy? A little bit, but was there potential there? Most definitely. Woody Harrelson is one of those performers where I generally tend to really enjoy his performances, and I think he does unhinged characters pretty well, honestly. So there was a lot of potential when it came to him taking on the role in Sony's sequel to Venom, Let There Be Carnage. Also, Andy Serkis directing, I thought that would be a good time. Unfortunately, that film just, in my opinion, was not 
very good. The corny elements were just too overwhelming for me to really enjoy it. Although I do still think it had some value in terms of just like pure raw entertainment. If you want to be entertained, it'll probably do that for you. I think it's always hard when you're bringing a character like Carnage to live action though, because it makes everything that he is so much more real. It's hard for you to connect with someone like Cletus. So you either have to make him the best bad guy around and make him really, really terrible and unrelatable, which is usually done really well in the comics, I'd say, or you have to build some kind of bridge for the audience to connect with him, which honestly, good luck in that regard. And I do think the movie kind of tries to do that a little bit and it's a disservice, I think, a little. Still, it was cool to see the attempt, and I did like some of the stuff that they did with him in terms of the approaches to the fights and, you know, his views of the world. Number six, Spider Carnage. For a brief time, Ben Riley was actually Carnage, or a version of Carnage, rather. He became known as Spider Carnage. This happened after the Carnage symbiote had escaped Ravencroft. Ben Riley actually chose, as Spider Man, to put himself in the path of Carnage, sacrificing himself to bond with it so that he could protect others from the sadistic symbiote. He was like, I will be the only one, that way no one else will be hurt by it. However, this wouldn't last too long, only a few issues. John Jameson, son of J. Jonah Jameson, would help to free Ben Riley Spider-Man by targeting him with microwave radiation. Actually, that would really hurt. I would not want to be microwaved. Still, the idea of Carnage wielding Ben Riley is pretty cool to me. While Carnage is definitely one of the most evil Spider-Man villains around, he also happens to be one of the most powerful symbiotes as well, with his strength at times rivaling even that of Venom. In fact, I would say most, most days it's rivaling Venom. Maybe not now, but in the past for sure. Number five, Patton Parnell. Patton Parnell has to be one of my favorite of the evil alternate Spider-Man out there, and I think he would make a bomb villain in Across the Spider-Verse Part 1, especially if we get some kind of League of Evil Spider-Man. Patton Parnell is the alternate Spider-Man from Earth 51412. Like the Spider who is on Part 1 of our list, Parnell also has some sociopathic tendencies and enjoys recreational activities like burning ants with a magnifying glass. He ends up becoming a Spider-Man in a more literal sense, becoming a spider-like monstrosity who is also capable of laying eggs, as his uncle Ted, who also appears to mistreat young Patton, finds out. Rather than Patton Parnell having an origin story of fantasy and heroism, his origin is basically more like a horror story, where Patton ends up as a murderous, monstrous, spider-like villain who develops a taste for human flesh and terrorizes his next door neighbor and crush, Sarah Jane. Number four, Tyler Stone. We talked about Alchemex, the villainous future corporation on the part one to our list, and even an alternate video game reality where Peter ends up as the man behind that corporation, but we have yet to focus on the vice president of Alchemex's R&D department in the main 2099 reality of Earth 9 to eight, Tyler Stone. Tyler Stone is not only VP of Research and Development at Alchemex, but also is secretly Miguel O'Hara's biological father. Tyler Stone had an affair with the wife of one of his employees, Conchata, who is Miguel's mother. Miguel doesn't learn until later on that he is the son of Stone and ends up on the staff of Alchemex, working as a brilliant geneticist for them. When he tries to leave, however, it is Stone who slips him the highly addictive drug only made by Alchemex known as Rapture to prevent him from leaving. Fortunately, Miguel manages to free himself via experimentation, which also gives him spider-like powers and abilities, becoming Spider-Man 2099. Number three, Spider Carnage. Similar to the spider on part one of our list, Spider Carnage is another evil alternate version of Peter Parker, or at least, he thinks he's Peter Parker. Spider Carnage came into being following Miles Warren cloning Peter. In this reality, Peter lost his Uncle Ben and later also his Aunt May, which left him completely broken hearted. His state of mind was only made worse when he was made to believe the version who had escaped Miles, dyeing his hair blonde and taking up the name Ben Riley, might actually be the true Peter Parker, with Peter potentially being the clone. This revelation filled Peter with hatred for Ben and would later fuel the bond he had with the Carnage symbiote, who entered into his world via an interdimensional portal during a time when Peter fought Ben. His rage and the symbiote turned him into a villain known as Spider Carnage, and his plan was to destroy all realities across the multiverse. This version of Spider Carnage appeared in the 90s animated Spider-Man television series. Number 2, Red Goblin. Red Goblin isn't necessarily an alternate variant considering he is the main reality 616 Norman Osborn, but Superior Spider-Man is also technically Earth 616's Otto Octavius, and I counted him last time without much complaints, so I figured we could 
put Red Goblin on this list and it should be fine. Red Goblin is a villain that comes from a period in Marvel Comics where a depowered Norman Osborn ended up getting his hands on the Carnage symbiote and convincing it to bond with him. With both of them bonding over how they enjoyed hurting and tormenting people. Yikes. The Carnage symbiote also helped to cure Norman Osborn of the antidote that was blocking him from using the Goblin Serum to regain his previous power set. So this version comes with both the powers of Carnage and those of Green Goblin. Plus you get the brilliant and twisted minds of Norman and Carnage combined. Who doesn't want Red Goblin? He's such a cool villain. Put him in across the Spider-Verse! Number 1. Evil Spider-Man Army with the potential for characters like Pat and Parnell, Spider Carnage, or 65's Lizard, Ultimatum, Superior Spider Man, The Spider, and Peter Parker 2099 to show up, it seems plausible that we could get a whole evil Spider Man army, or evil Spider army, in Across the Spider Verse. I don't know about you, but I'd love to see some evil Spider Men team up to take on the heroic Spider folks we've come to know and love from the previous film and beyond in the comics. I think that would be super cool. The reality is in the multiverse, we we don't even need an external threat. The threat could simply be Spider-Man himself, considering there are so many great evil possibilities that appear throughout the catalog of Marvel's multiversal realities. At number 10 is Phoenix Force Magneto. In this reality, Magneto merged with the fiery cosmic force, forging a fearsome union. His quest to mold Hope Summers into a Phoenix host underscored his unrelenting will, defying warnings from the Avengers and X-Men alike. Yet this fusion spiraled into chaos, necessitating a coalition from Charles Xavier, the Hulk, and Wolverine to quell the cataclysm. The prospect of a Phoenix Magneto conjures an ominous blend, melding two extremes, the cosmic Phoenix Force and Magneto's unyielding darkness. Unlike others, Magneto swiftly succumbed to the Force's corrupting influence, illuminating his inherent malevolence. This accelerated plunge led to a world-shattering clash, sparing only Wolverine through Jean Grey's timely intervention. In a universe where Magneto harnesses the Phoenix, a realm engulfing menace emerges. In defeat, this fusion echoes a staggering potency and unbridled havoc they embody, weaving a tale of mutant and cosmic might on an unprecedented scale. If you're enjoying the video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. At number 9 is Juggernautical. Juggernaut as a massive boat. Uh, yeah, the multiverse is weird, you guys. Anyways, the Juggernautical, a seafaring behemoth, is unlike any other. See, this colossal ship being was no ordinary vessel. It was the marionette of a mystical book, a navigator of the arcane. But as fate would have it, this enigmatic tomb found its way into the clutches of none other than Admiral Harry Greich, a high-breaking officer of the Royal Navy. A perfect storm brewed as the Juggernautical set its course upon the Exiles, a group tasked with mending the threads of the multiverse, and the Juggernautical even crossed paths with the infamous Blackbeard. Yet, the winds of fortune are ever fickle. In a cinematic clash, Blink emerged as the hero of this otherworldly seafaring saga. With a flicker of teleportation mastery, she wrestled control of the book from the Greich's grasp and in an act of defiance, hurled it into the abysmal depths of the ocean. At number 8 is Sabretooth. I mean, it's a team up of Sabretooths from across the multiverse, so I'm calling the team the Sabretooth. In an alternate reality, a ferocious female Sabretooth is abducted by Graydon Creed, who's on a mission to eradicate versions of Sabretooth across the multiverse. She's imprisoned with other Sabretooths, all of whom have their power suppressed. Together they break free, confront Graydon, and after a fierce battle, banish him through a portal. United by their experience, they opt to stay in Earth-616, seizing a spaceship to embark on their own interdimensional adventure. At number 7 is Baron Sinister. Welcome to Battle World, the tapestry of twisted domains where alternate realities collide. Among these shards of existence, we find the enigmatic Baron Sinister ruling over his own dominion. Bar Sinister, a realm inhabited by clones and created by the tyrant's hand. But clones can't be the only thing on this villain's menu, as he keeps a select few non-clones as playthings for his whims. Now Sinister and King Hyperion, two formidable forces, conspire against the House of Braddock of Higher Avalon. Exposed and accused of discord, Sinister Sinister faced trial under the gaze of God Emperor Doom's enforcers. A duel between Baron Sinister and Baron Bradoff then ensued. Amidst the crumbling Doom's rule, Sinister, edged on by Captain Marvel, joined the rebellion, leading to clashes and a betrayal that culminated in his demise at the hands of Baron Apocalypse. At number 6 is Dark Phoenix Mystique. So this Mystique story is pretty familiar, shadowing the path of her mainstream self up until King Loki decides to give his brother Thor a run from his money with a Harley dose of suffering. During all this, Mystique decides it's time to settle her score with none other than Logan, aka Wolverine. She whips out this Phoenix Blaster, 
yeah, you heard me right, stealing away the Phoenix Force from him and spreading his body parts across the vast expanse of the multiverse. Her stint as the Dark Phoenix lands her a recruitment offer from the Multiversal Masters of Evil. These folks go on a multi-reality rampage, taking out prehistoric heroes left and right. Cue the showdown as they target Earth 616 prehistory. The prehistoric Avengers then team up with time-traveling counterparts for a nine-day cosmic brawl. But ultimately, Dark Phoenix Mystique faces her reckoning, confronting the forces of creation and meeting her end in the torrent of the first firmament. Number five, Superior Spider-Man. Superior Spider-Man is a version of Spider-Man who is also Dr. Otto Octavius. Let me explain. Back in the 616 comic book continuity, Otto is basically dying and manages to trick Peter into a body swap scenario. While Peter is trapped inside Otto's failing body and dies, Otto lives on in Peter's body as Spider-Man. Superior Spider-Man to be exact, because you know, this is Otto, so he's like, I'm gonna be the best Spider-Man ever. Peter would eventually return and Otto would also go back to his usual Doc Ock appearance and his hijinks, but for a time, he was the Spider-Man of the 616 reality. He's done good and bad things before in the comics and ended up accidentally bringing back the Inheritors after they were defeated the first time in Spider-Verse. Oops. Superior Spider-Man, while known for being a villain, is also like an anti-hero, so we could really see him in either light were he to show up in Across the Spider-Verse Part 1. But yeah, he's been a villain and a hero, so I figured I could still count him as a villain for this list. I just really want Superior Spider-Man. Man. I think a lot of us do. Number four, Army of Doc Ox. Why stop at one? Or I guess two Doc Ox when we could have a whole army of them, right? I mean, there isn't just Doc Ock, Otto Octavius somewhere out there. We also have Olivia Liv, Octavius's version, and we could have Superior Spider-Man as well. There are lots of cool alternates of Otto out in the multiverse that we could meet in Across the Spider-Verse, and Doc Ock is such a powerful and interesting villain that we could have a whole army of them to face. I'm not sure what the motivation would be, or like who would ultimately be the Doc Ock in charge, the like head Doc Ock, maybe superior, but I'm sure when all those octopi put their minds and I guess their tentacles together, they could come up with some pretty ingenious schemes. Also, I feel like now that I said put their tentacles together, I'm like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but uh, I said it. And you know what? Sometimes you gotta be like all tentacles in and then get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> Number three, the spider. The spider is one of the worst alternate versions of Spider-Man we've ever met. He is super evil and is basically a version of Peter Parker that is combined with Cletus Cassidy. This alternate version of Peter Parker has red hair and was born a sociopath. Cause I guess everyone that has red hair is a sociopath. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand that connection, but you know, people with red hair, apparently they have no souls. He possesses a dark sense of humor and enjoys causing pain to others. He first showed up in the Exile series and hails from Earth 15. Like Carnage on Earth 616, he revels in hurting others. He possesses a symbiote very similar to Carnage, although it is actually known as the Spider symbiote instead of the Carnage symbiote in this reality. What could be cooler than seeing Miles and the rest of the Spider army take on an alternate and evil version of Peter Parker? Also, Let There Be Carnage did well at the box office, right? I'm pretty sure it did. So wouldn't it make sense to have some kind of version of Carnage show up here? And this is like both. It's like a Spidey and a Carnage together. Number two, Morlin. I'm actually a really big fan of Morlin, even though I feel like he's not really everybody's cup of tea. He's my cup of tea. I like the fact that he's a Victorian style energy vampire from an alternate past. Morlin feeds on the energy of spider totems, hunting them down and feeding off of them. He is extremely powerful by himself and is sometimes not even just a one energy vampire kind of deal. So sometimes if you're facing Morlin, it's not just Morlin you're facing. Morlin has proven to be a hard foe to beat, especially because he rarely stays is dead for long and usually shows back up to torment Spider-Man and taunt him, often threatening that he will be his end. Morlin is also the guy who ate Spider-Man's eye that one time when he was on the brink of death, plagued by a mysterious ailment. Number one. The Inheritors. The Inheritors are the rest of Morlin's crew and family. They are a powerful energy vampire clan which hunt down various totems and consume them. Because yeah, there aren't just spider totems out there apparently. There's lots of other totems. Spider totems, by the way, if you're confused by what, what that means, are basically spider folks from across the multiverse who are destined to end up being connected to the spirit of the spider. Either possessing powers related to spiders or some other important connection, which which generally gives them purpose in their life. The Inheritors ended up getting control over the Master Weaver, thereby turning him into an enemy of the spider totems, even though that wasn't his intended purpose to begin with.
They use the Master Weaver's knowledge and power to travel the multiverse and hunt down spider totems within it. The inheritors are generally led by Solus or Morlin, and their members have included Verna, Genix, Karn, Bora, Brix, Dora, Deimos, Malos, Morcia, Namura, and Thanis. And I probably said some of those wrong, so sorry about that. Like Morlin, they are also from the alternate reality where 001. And in case you didn't know, the inheritors were kind of like the main thing when we had Spider Verse in the comics and then Spider Geddon. So it would make sense that they would show up at some point in these movies. Please, I would like to see it. Maybe I'm the only one? I don't know. Number 10, All Father Doom. This is the Doom of 2099 who would become known as All Father Doom. He made his first full appearance in Doom 2099 issue number one after previously appearing in Marvel Comics Presents issue 118 in a preview. Doom's origins are pretty wild in this universe, to be honest. The reality of Earth 928. Initially, he woke up to the year 2099, he was in pain, and he seemed to have no clear recollection of all the years that had passed prior to him waking. He simply knew who he was, and what that meant. Seeking out his nation of Latveria, Doom discovered upon returning to the capital that someone else now ruled the nation in his stead, a cyborg known as Tiger Wild. Initially, Doom failed to best Wild in combat in his attempt to win back his throne. However, this is Doom we're talking about, and eventually, he would concoct a plan that would successfully allow him to reclaim his place as a ruler, reclaiming the love of his people and defeating Wild for once and for all. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that like button? Just give it a little, little click. Woo! Number nine, what if Invisible Girl of the Fantastic Four married the Submariner? This version of Doom hails from a reality where Spider-Man was given permission to join the Fantastic Four, with the team becoming renamed as the Fantastic Five for a period. As a result of this, Susan Storm also left the team to be with Namor, breaking Reed's heart. Here, Doom was more easily defeated by the team now that Spider-Man had joined their ranks. While I'm sure this might sound disappointing to other Doctor Doom fans out there, don't be too disappointed by this loss because this Doctor Doom of 772 would also go on to be chosen to set out to protect time. At first at the behest of the Whisperer, who actually turned out to be the villainous Kang alternate Immortus, and later in a bid to help stop Immortus and the Time Twisters, chosen to do so again by the Time Variance Authority, or as we fondly know them now, the TVA. Number 8, Doominator. In the reality of Earth 691, Doom actually was an ally to heroes in a battle to defend this Earth against the Martian Masters. A millennia later, it was revealed that Doom, long thought dead, was actually, somehow, still alive. Now how did he do this? Well, he had taken the place of Wolverine, successfully killing Logan, and then putting his own brain inside Logan's adamantium coated skeleton, thereby taking control of Logan's form while also prolonging Doom's own life. Later, Rancor would end up traveling to Earth, seeking out her ancestor Wolverine. Rancor and a disguised Doom both agreed to work together initially, but it was later revealed that Rancor had never really intended to actually follow through and actually planned on betraying Doom by attacking him, with him later revealing to her the truth of his identity once she had turned. Also to be clear, I'm calling this character Doominator myself because it kinda looks like the Terminator in that adamantium coated skeleton. <laughs> but that is not an official name or an editorial name used for this character, just when I chose myself. Number 7, Age of Apocalypse. In the Age of Apocalypse reality of Earth 295, Doom is still the ruler of Latveria. He obviously rules one of the few places that initially Apocalypse does not yet control here. Apocalypse first conquers the US in this reality, and Doom is one of the surviving humans who attempts to actually come together with other people to stop Apocalypse from fully taking over the world. He becomes the director of the Eurasian security for the Human High Council, but ends up being tricked into a meeting with Mikhail Rasputin that is really part of a plan to try and conquer the human race. Mikhail is hoping to basically convert humans into cyborgs that he could then use to fight against Apocalypse himself. This version of Doom isn't so much a straight up villain anymore as he's one of the people who actually stands up against Apocalypse, the true villain on this alternate earth and in its story. Number 6, Emperor Von Doom. This is always a weird one to me. This version of Doom comes from one of the versions of Earth that are glimpsed in the Marvel novel trilogy that Chaos Engine. In the book X-Men slash Doctor Doom, The Chaos Engine, we visit Earth 892, where Doom, using the Cosmic Cube, is able to rule over Earth. In this story, three different villains get their hands on the Cosmic Cube, and are able to use it to rewrite history to basically create their own alternate Earths. In the reality that Doom rules, Earth 892, he has convinced Storm to join him as his wife and empress. Together, the couple also have two children, a son and a daughter. I know, surprise. 
surprising. I mean, they do have chemistry, but I don't feel like Storm would ever marry Doom in the main continuity. Number five, Norana Sorman. Norana Sorman is the dinosaur version of Norman Osborn from Earth 66. That's right, he's got a dinosaur alternate. If you were curious to learn more about him, I would highly recommend checking out Edge of Spider Verse issue number one, where he made his first and only appearance. Norana Sorman is, of course, a Tyrannosaurus Rex who enjoys preying on smaller, weaker dinos like Tur Tarker, a pterodon. Man, who, who doesn't love dinosaur versions of characters? I know I do. Both Pater and Norin were the, in the middle of a fight when they were struck by an alien spider infested meteor which had fallen to Earth. The collision caused them to swap bodies and also left Tur, now in Norin's body, with spider like abilities and powers. Tragically, this one issue that Norin appears in is probably all we will get to see of him based on what happens in this story. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Number four, Goblin Gwen. Not an official editorial name or used for her currently, I don't think, but just a name that fits with the current way that we tend to name our alternate Gwens in the Marvel multiverse. Currently in her reality of her 3109, Gwen was known simply as Green Goblin or just Gwen Stacy. This character makes her first appearance in Spider Gwen, Ghost Spider issue number one from 2018. Here we learn that this version of the character actually started out as a hero, fighting side by side with this universe's Spider-Man, Harry Osborn. After the death of both Harry and losing her father, George Stacy, Gwen's goblin persona takes hold of her, successfully becoming her dominant persona for years, until Ghost Spider, Gwen Stacy of Earth 65, arrived and was able to help Goblin Gwen's friends, Mary Jane and Peter Parker, track her down so that they could cure her. Number three, President Ozzy Osbourne. President Osbourne hails from the same Earth as everyone's favorite new Spider-Man from across the Spider-Verse, Spider-Punk, and one of my favorite alternate spider folks for years. In this reality, Norman is known as Ozzy Osbourne, Norman Ozzy Osbourne. In this reality, his company Oscorp created Venom. Spider-Punk defeated him in the midst of a riot using some amps and an electric guitar. He really is the coolest, honestly. Despite the fact that it had seemed that Spider-Punk had pretty permanently, I'll say, defeated Osbourne by, well, separating his head from his body, in reality, Norman still lived, but secretly ran the country from behind the scenes, letting everyone else believe he was really gone to help strengthen his position as his demise had left him a martyr in the eyes of the people. President Osborne would return with a robotic body to fight against not just Spider-Punk, but also his fellow allies, Captain Anarchy, Riot Heart, and Kamala Khan. Number two, Ultimate Green Goblin. Ultimate Green Goblin hails from the universe of Earth 1610, also known as the Ultimate Universe. Named after the line of comics it appeared in, which itself was named after the Ultimates, this universe's version of the Avengers team, although they also have an Avengers team as well, but that team is kind of more like DC. Suicide Squad in terms of makeup and purpose, so although it's named the Avengers, it's only really in name alone. In this universe, Green Goblin is a lot more physically intimidating, more beast-like or demonic in appearance, with giant muscles, giant arms, and giant feet. Still, this version of Green Goblin is also Norman Osborn, founder and CEO of Oscorp. Norman in this reality surmised that because an Oz formula altered Spider had basically given Spider-Man his abilities and powers, that he himself could use the same formula mixed with his own DNA to become a superior version of himself. However, clearly this backfired, instead transforming Norman into a big green monster. Maybe because inside he is a big green monster, who knows. Number one, Raimiverse. I mean, probably one of the best versions of Norman Osborn out there is Willem Dafoe's interpretation of the character for Sam Raimi's Spider-Man films. I love that this version of the character has become so iconic, despite the fact that Willem Dafoe really only played Green Goblin and Norman Osborn in that first film. At least, you know, while the character was alive. After that, it is just the ghost of Norman who basically haunts his son Harry, demanding that he avenge him. I think I love the fact that mainly this Norman is only featured in the first film and yet his presence just lingers throughout really this entire franchise, really based mainly on his performance just in that first film alone. Willem Dafoe just also feels like a perfect cast for that role and clearly understood the depth to this character, cementing him as a villain that feels surprisingly real for a guy that dresses up as a goblin like like it's Halloween and flies around on a glider throwing little explosive pumpkins down at his enemies. I mean, that all sounds pretty ridiculous. And yet Willem Dafoe has convinced me it's serious business in those movies. Serious business, but also sometimes silly. You can be both. Dude.